Hi, good evening friends. So today we'll be having the surgery mega revision session for the FMG July 2023 exam. So this would be a basically a mega marathon revision series where we'll be trying to cover as much as and maximum number of topics that is possible for your upcoming FMG exam. So definitely surgery is a vast subject and we might not be able to cover all the topics but definitely we'll be trying to cover almost all the major topics. Right. So let's begin with the general surgery part. So I've divided this session into various other modules. So I'll begin with the general surgery part. So first we'll discuss some important points from the metabolic response to injury. So again, I would repeat, it's not the detailed explanations that we would be going for, but we will be trying to focus on the most important points uh, that are very important for your exams. Right. So the metabolic response to injury. So the in, there is an initial period of catabolism right in the metabolic response to any injury or stress followed by which there is an anabolic phase of repair and tissue healing the mortality which is associated with your multi-organ dysfunction syndrome is your 25 percent so this is again a potential one-liner which comes as a true or false statement in your exam then we have this ebb and flow model which was given by the gentleman david Cuthbertson. Right. So what it says that following the injury, there is an ebb phase which begins within hours and this is manifested by shock. Now following that in days, there is the flow phase where occurs the catabolism. And then is your recovery phase which takes week and usually anabolism occurs during that phase. Right. Now the metabolic response to injury is graded. So what do you mean by this gradation? That means that more severe the injury is, the greater would be the response. Right. Now, there is also a role of the genetic variability which plays a key role in determining the intensity of the inflammatory response. So the genetic variability also plays a key role in determine, determining the intensity of your inflammatory response. So the purpose of giving you this important one-liners from the metabolic response to injury is that they might just come as a true or false statement in your questions for which you need to know. Now, this is a new table which has been added in your current edition of your Bailey and Luck. So there are some secondary triggers to the metabolic response to injury, which includes sepsis, hemorrhage, massive transfusion, acidosis, surgery, crush syndrome, ischemia and reperfusion. So this events can amplify or prolong the catabolic phase leading to the organ failure or the immune dysfunction. So the question that can be framed from here, which of the following is or are the secondary triggers? You might get the options as acidosis, surgery, hemorrhage and then the last option being your all of the above or they might ask you which of the following is not a secondary trigger of the metabolic response from where they might be giving you this option one of the most options which they would want to change in your exam would be acidosis being replaced by alkalosis so please remember acidosis is your secondary trigger in the metabolic response to injury then your next important question is regarding your cocktail of counter regulatory hormones so which are the hormones that contribute to the cocktail of this uh, counter-regulatory hormone that includes glucagon, glucocorticoids and catecholamine. So if they are infused, they may actually produce many aspects of your metabolic response. Now, a few important points regarding the growth hormone. You need to remember that growth hormone is lipolytic. It is insulin antagonizing and has a pro-inflammatory properties, right? So the questions have been framed from this uh, stating growth hormone is lipolytic, insulin antagonizing, anti-inflammatory, pro-inflammatory. So which of the following is not true? Please remember anti-inflammatory growth hormone is your pro-inflammatory. Then you have your pro-inflammatory cytokines. So the list of pro-inflammatory cytokines includes interleukin-1, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6 and interleukin-8. So these are some of the examples of your pro-inflammatory cytokines. 
now regarding your cortisol there's an important point that you guys need to remember now this cortisol is immunosuppressive at high levels and it acts synergistically with IL-6 to promote hepatic acute phase response so this again forms a very important one-liner for your true or false question now the damage associated molecular patterns which are also known as alarmants which are sensed by the toll like receptors after the injury insert includes which of the molecules they include your heat shock protein high mobility group protein box uh, b1 then you have your s100 protein and fragment of nucleic acid so this all are examples of your alarmants now coming down to the next point is this beautiful a uh, uh, diagram that has been taken from your Bailey and Love. So if you look over here, this is the integrated response to the surgical injury, right? Where there is a complex interplay between the neuroendocrine stress response and the pro-inflammatory cytokine. So if you look over here, from the pituitary, you have the release of ACTH and growth hormone which is under the influence of your hypothalamus. Now, this is going to cause your lipolysis and increase in the adipocytes. Now, in case of adrenal, the increase in adrenaline cortisol. Now, this in turn is going to cause your hepatic gluconeogenesis. Now, then we have your pancreas, which secrete your glucagon. Now, this is going to cause your hepatic acute phase protein synthesis. And now you have the interplay between the adaptive and the innate immune system which causes insulin reduction, IGF reduction, testosterone reduction and T3 reduction which results in your hypermetabolism and the pyrexia is because of the effects of your IL-1, 6, 8 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Right. So you need to remember this table as in your uh, questions and the questions can be framed from this chart like stating in hypermetabolism um, the levels of insulin is raised or in, uh, decreased it's decreased similarly you have your decreased levels of testosterone t3 and igf1 now coming down to the another important topic which is your specialized pro resolving mediator so which are, what are the molecules that constitute your specialized pro resolving mediator so they include your lipoxins resolvins protectins and myrcins right so again this could be a match the following on a question or it could be a true or false question from this specialized pro resolving mediators now, the predominant hormone in the catabolic phase includes your catecholamine, cortisol and aldosterone. So, please remember that these three are your predominant hormones regulating your catabolic phase, which are your catecholamine, cortisol and aldosterone. So, the key characteristics of the metabolic response to inju injury, if we summarize, it is a rapid onset driven by the pro-inflammatory cytokines which are IL-1, 6 and TNF-alpha, then this is broadly related to the injury severity that is most severe in sepsis, burn and major trauma. Then it varies between the individual that is your genetic variability. Then it causes catabolism, muscle breakdown, immunosuppression and organ dysfunction or failure. Then it is counterbalanced by the antagonist response but the balance may be actually imperfect. Then they are obviously prolonged by the sepsis or the secondary insoles and they can become chronic and they are associated with most late deaths from injury or surgery in your developed health system. Right. Now some important one-liners, the major site of protein loss is actually your peripheral skeletal muscle. You need to remember that cardiac muscles are usually spared. This protein loss may occur also in your respiratory muscles and the gut. But usually the cardiac muscles are spared. So which of the following muscles are spared in the form of protein loss and catabolism? The answer to that would be your cardiac muscle. 
Now, regarding your skeletal muscle wasting, it provides amino acids for the metabolic support of your central organ or tissues. It is mediated at a molecular le level mainly by the activation. So, this important pathway needs to be remembered ubiquitin proteasome pathway. So, if the question is asked, which of the following is the main pathway? The answer would be ubiquitin proteasome pathway. Now, if the question is framed to you, which of the following are the pathways which are included option being given your ubiquitin proteasome pathway lysosomal cathepsin and calcium calpin pathway and d would be all of the above in that case guys do not mark ubiquitin proteasome pathway because it is asking which of the following are involved so all the three pathways are involved but if you need to mark only one the major the major pathway is your ubiquitin proteasome pathway right now next important question comes regarding your positive phase reactants and your negative phase reactant so i made a list out of over here for you the positive phase reactants include your mannose binding protein haptoglobin crp ceruloplasmin complement alpha 1 antitrypsin ferritin fibrinogen amyloid now in case of negative phase it includes your transthyretin transferritin transcortin antithrombin albumin and retinol binding protein right so this is a very commonly repeated question where they may ask you the questions like which of the following is an example of positive phase reactant transferrin transcortin antithrombin ferritin so the answer would be ferritin they usually have tendency to give this ferritin fibrinogen along with this option so please do not get confused and remember this list now coming down to the next important concept is regarding your insulin resistance so what they usually ask is now a patient has undergone an upper abdominal surgery now this insulin resistance may actually persist till how many days so it usually persists up till two weeks and now this two weeks can actually be prolonged more in case of sepsis so they might form a clinical based scenario saying that the patient must have gone in upper abdominal surgery say beat an open cholecystectomy or a cbd exploration and they give you a clinical scenario that the insulin uh, symptoms suggestive of insulin resistance so you need to remember that this insulin resistance may actually persist up to two weeks now the body turnover liver and the skeletal muscle account actually for around 50 percent of the daily body turnover now in this case the skeletal muscle is usually the large mass with the low turnover rate whereas in case of liver it is a small mass with a high protein turnover rate now guys you need to remember this again a true and false question skeletal muscle is a small mass with a high protein turnover rate no it is a false statement liver is a small mass with a high protein turnover rate yes it is a true statement so they might give you a combination over here with your skeletal muscle and liver and frame a question so you need to be prepared for this now the next question that comes is your major export protein produced by the liver so the answer to that is your albumin now a few important points with respect to it is that it is renewed at the rate of around 10 percent per day now the trans -capillary, capillary escape rate is around 10 times more and the albumin tr may be actually increased three folds right during your major sepsis now one value-based question which is a favorite of your examiners is the one gram of nitrogen right is contained within 6.25 gram of protein which is contained in approximate 36 gram of wet weight tissue so this is an important one-liner which you guys need to remember as this has been frequently asked prior in your examinations right now Coming down to the factors that exacerbate the metabolic response to surgery, right? So, which includes your immobilization, hypothermia, hypotension, and starvation. So, this wound, hypo, wound factors, hypothermia, hypotension, pain would actually cause your adrenosympathetic activation and cytokine cascade release, now which results in your pyrexia, 
acute phase response, insulin resistance, futile substrate cycling and your muscle protein degradation which causes catabolism followed by your inhibition of anabolism. Right. So during starvation body is faced with an obligate need of to generate gl glucose to sustain the cerebral energy metabolism so what is the value of this so this is your 100 grams of glucose per day which is needed to sustain the cerebral energy metabolism now Another important uh, question is coming regarding your protein sparing effect. So when does this protein sparing effect occurs? So the provision of IV4 dextrose and 0.18% uh, sodium chloride as maintained IV fluid for surgical patients who are fasting provides around 80 gram of glucose per day so if the question is asked the amount of glucose for your protein sparing effect the answer would be 80 gram and if they are asking you to sustain the cerebral energy metabolism the answer would be your 100 gram of glucose per day right now the current concept of enhanced recovery after surgery like which is known as your eras protocol nowadays the major surgeries are being shifted down to the eras protocol so what you need to remember a few important points regarding eras minimal assess technique block it to the afferent painful stimuli there should be minimal period of starvation early mobilization and one shot spinal dimorphin and or six to 12 hour of infusion is usually opiate sparing improves gut function and enhance your overall recovery right now there's one more important concept which is to avoid the surgical site infection and as the intraoperative component of your eras which is your no bugs technique so they might actually ask you which of the following is not the component or which of the following is the component so you guys need to remember the no bugs so what is your no bugs and for normothermia that is temperature should be more than 36 degrees celsius oxygenation antibiotics then you have your under ventilation etco2 should be more than 38 then the glycemic control glucose should be less than 180 milligram per deciliter and you have your skin preparation and should include no shaving so this is your no bugs criteria which is used in your eras protocol right so as per the eras protocol you need to follow this and you need uh, you need to keep to the minimal periods of starvation and early mobilization right so this were your few important points with respect to your metabolic response to injury so over here you would be basically getting much more of your one-liner direct or they might make a clinical scenario but eventually turn to ask you your know, one-liner questions now coming down to the next important general surgery chapter is regarding your shock so you need to remember that the most common cause of death in surgical patient is your shock right now this table the importance of this table cannot be emphasized right each and every exam at least one question is definitely there from this table so these are your various class of shock now class 1 class 2 class 3 class 4 so regarding the blood volume it is less than 15 percent in case of class 1 in class 2 you have your 15 to 30 in class 3 you have your 30 to 40 percent and in class 4 you have your more than 40 percent the heart rate is usually normal when you talk about class 1 whereas it comes down to class 2 2 it may be normal or may increase but in case of class 3 you will definitely have a tachycardia and class 4 is definitely a tachycardia blood pressure now if you see over here it is usually normal in class 1 and 2 and it tends to fall from your class 3 and definitely being more pronounced in your class 4 the pulse pressure is again normal in class 1 starts to fall in class 2 and keeps falling further as the class of shock increases now again with your respiratory rate you have your class 1 
where the respiratory rate is usually normal class 2 again being normal again it starts increasing in 3 and pronounced in your class 4 now the urine output is normal in class 1 and 2 it usually begins to fall from class 3 and then it is definitely pronounced severe in your class 4 of, of shock now this table which i have uh, teaching you out here is from your advanced trauma life support guidelines 10th edition right now gcs again begins to fall from class 3 and class 4 and you have your base deficit which is 0 to uh, minus 2 in class 1 minus 2 to minus 6 in class 2 and minus 6 to minus 10 in class 3 and minus 10 or less in class 4 now the need for transfusion is definitely uh, needed in case of your class 4 which is the MTP. MTP over here is a massive transfusion protocol which is in the ratio 1 is to 1 is to 1 of your packed red blood cells, platelets and the fresh frozen plasma. Right and there might be the need of transfusion in your class 3 shop. Now coming down to the next important, uh, so this is your important table for shock, so be it, uh, be it for your exam, make sure that you revise this table and go. The questions can be framed directly from the table or they might give you a clinical scenario where a patient has presented to you an emergency department following a road traffic accident and gives you the vitals regarding your urine output, blood volume, heart rate, blood pressure and they ask you regarding your class of shock. Now, regarding your cardiovascular and metabolic characteristics of shock. So, again, a five-star table from your shock chapter. Right. So, this parameters, cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance, venous pressure, mixed venous saturation, and base deficit. So, they would just simply give you a combination of the various parameters and try to ask you the uh, which type of shock it is. So, in case of hypovolemic shock, the cardiac output is low, the systemic vascular resistance is high, the venous pressure is low, mixed venous saturation is low and the base deficit is high. Now in case of your cardiogenic shock, you have again a low cardiac output, a high systemic vascular resistance, a high venous pressure and a low mixed venous saturation and a high base deficit. Now in case of an obstructive shock, you have a low cardiac output, a high systemic vascular resistance, a high venous pressure, a low mixed venous saturation and a high base deficit. Whereas in case of distributive shock, please remember you have a high cardiac output, a low systemic vascular resistance, a low venous pressure, high mixed venous saturation and a high base deficit. So most of the questions are usually framed from this distributive shock but then Questions have also been found from your cardiogenic and hypovolemic and obstructive. So we need to remember this table. So this is a five star table which you need to revise before you go for your exam. Now regarding your clinical features of shock which can be either compensated or uncompensated. Now in case of a compensated, now you have your lactic acidosis which is mildly present. In moderate you it increases and it is very severe in case of severe shock. Now, urine output is usually normal in case of mild compensated shock. It is reduced in case of moderate and anuric in cases of severe. Now, you have your conscious level which is mild anxiety, drowsy, comatose. Then you have your respiratory rate which is increased in case of mild shock, moderate and it is labored in case of your severe shock. Now, the pulse rate is again increased in your mild shock. It is increased in moderate and increased in your severe shock. So the blood pressure is normal, mild hypotension in case of moderate and severe hypotension in case of severe. Right. So this important one liner. So this table is again very important. So for your shock, it's important that you know the table, but at the same time, it will be all clinical based scenarios. So you can form a plenty of clinical scenarios from this uh, particular table where they might just play out with the respiratory rate, pulse, blood pressure. So please do remember these three important tables of your shock and I'm pretty sure you would be able to answer almost all the questions that come from here. Now, there are up to 25% of all trauma patients which develop acute traumatic coagulopathy within minutes of injury and it is associated with your 
four fold increase in your mortality so there are basically three one liners in this how many patients develop acute traumatic coagulopathy 25% within how many minutes hours or days it's usually within minutes and it is associated with how many times increase in mortality it is your four fold increase in your mortality right so this is again a very important concept which has come these days which is regarding your damage control resuscitation we shall be discussing and taking them uh, when we discuss in the trauma section your damage control surgery but still if you look over here this would be your hemorrhage resuscitation right so if you look over here the goal is the coagulation function and the coronary perfusion so you have your damage control surgery permissive hypertension and balanced transfusion that is one is to one of rbc and ffp and you need to treat the coagulopathy by tranexamic acid platelets and fibrination now when to give a tranexamic acid when to give platelets when to give cryo so this is usually studied with the help of your thromboelastogram which is a viscoelastic acid so I'm not uh, included that thromboelastogram elast uh, viscoelastic assay in this uh, uh, revision session over here. So what you guys can actually do is we have shared this video in the Game PG YouTube app channel. So please make sure that you go and look at that graph and understand the basics of TG from which the questions can be framed. And then you need to monitor which is with the help of cardiovascular, BP and heart rate, electrolytes, coagulation and perfusion. Right, and then you have your perfusion tra uh, targeted resuscitation, which is your goal and organ perfusion, adequate preload and afterload fluids and pressures, and thromboprophylaxis. And you monitor again with the help of cardiovascular, BP, heart rate, cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance, organ function, and abdominal compartment by measurement of intra abdominal pressure. So, the five star question again the best measure of your organ perfusion and the best monitor of your adequacy of shock therapy is your urine output so there is no confusion regarding this right so the best measure of the organ perfusion and the best monitor of your adequacy of shock therapy is your urine output now regarding your monitors for organ and systemic uh, perfusion so if you look over here for your systemic perfusion you have your base deficit lactate and your mixed venous saturation now for your muscle you have your near infrared and tissue oxygen electrode now for your gut you have your sublingual capnometry gut mucosal ph and your laser flow doppler or uh, laser doppler flowmetry so the question that is usually framed from this table is which of the following is your monitor for your gut perfusion options being your sublingual capnometry gut mucosal ph or laser, laser doppler flowmetry and infra uh, near infrared spectroscopy so the answer is over here uh, sublingual capnometry gut mucosal and laser flow doppler are actually used but your near infrared spectroscopy, uh, spectroscopy is not used so near infrared spectroscopy and your tissue oxygen electrode is used for your muscle perfusion now the another important concept is regarding your mixed uh, venous saturation so the normal levels are your 50 to 70 percent now levels below 50 percent that is inadequate oxygen delivery and cause increased oxygen extraction by the cells now when you have levels more than 70 percent it is sepsis but now patient who are in sepsis and are having mixed venous saturation below 70 is said to have an associated hypovolumic shock or your cardiogenic shock so this is a very important concept of your normal mixed venous saturation that is frequently asked in your exam now Another important concept is regarding your base deficit. Now, there is a value which you guys need to remember that is your base deficit of more than 6 mole millimole per liter has a higher morbidity and mortality. Right. So they can just simply ask you which of the following base deficit values is associated with your higher morbidity and mortality. More than 3, more than 4, more than 5, more than 6. So these questions are usually confusing. So please make sure that you remember them. The answer over here would be more than 6 millimole per litre. 
right so this were your few questions that can be asked from this section of chalk the most important which you guys need to remember is your tables right the two tables differentiating your cardiogenic shock obstructive shock hypovolemic shock and distributive shock and a table of your various classes of shock class 1 class 2 class 3 class 4 right now we move down to the next section of the wound healing so yes friends i'll be focusing a lot on this general surgery aspect because these are some of the basic core general surgery topics which are actually frequently asked in your exam so it is very important that you guys do revise them and hence the purpose of investing a lot of initial time in your class on this particular topic right so now we move down to the wound healing so the wound healing one basic question that is actually straightforwardly asked what are the steps of wound healing right and they have asked you to arrange in the order so we'll be discussing the steps a little bit in detail because now each particular step ke sub steps there have been a lot of questions asked so the first step being your hemostasis right now following hemostasis you have your inflammation now inflammation you have your early inflammation or late inflammation now early inflammation occurs in day one and two so what happens over here platelet activation now this causes influx of your inflammatory cells now which is the most important cell the most important cell is your neutrophil and also plays the role of the polymorphonuclear leukocytes now they also release the vasoactive amine like histamine and serotonin now this increase your vascular permeability aiding infiltration of your inflammatory cells now in case of your late phase what happens this is usually day two or three now over your monocytes appear now they differentiate into the macrophages so if you look over here the comparison right the main cell over here is your neutrophil in your early phase which is day one and day two and late phase of inflammation that is day two or day three you have your monocytes converting into macrophages now this macrophages are your phagocytic cells and they are your proteolytic enzymes secreted so these are your phagocytic cells which secrete the proteolytic enzyme which causes the debridement of the wound now they are also the producer of cytokine and the growth factor which causes your fibroblast proliferation and your angiogenesis right so this was all about your inflammatory uh, so if you have a look at this this is a diagram which is showing your inflammatory phase of your wound healing so now we move down to the next step which is your proliferation phase so just a minute yeah so the proliferation phase this proliferation phase starts from your day three right so this proliferation phase starts from your day three now it lasts for around two to four weeks now it is mainly of your fibroblast activity so you can see each phase has one main hero that main hero is the main cell which you guys need to remember now this fibroblast activity is leads to the production of your ground substance which are your proteoglycans and your glycosaminoglycans now Production of the ground substance, which will include your collagen, angiogenesis, and your re-epithelization. Now, wound formed in your early phase is your granulation tissue. Now, later part, there is increase in tensile strength, increase collagen synthesis by your fibroblast. Now, the some fi fibroblast may actually convert into your myofibroblast, which are your myoepithelial cells. Now. These are your main cells in your contraction to bring the edge edges together. So you can look, this is your phase of proliferation. Now if you look at this, this is an image depicting the phase, of the, phase, uh, the phase of your proliferation. Now coming down to the last phase of your wound healing is your remodeling. So it lasts, starts at the end of two to three weeks. It lasts for around one year. Now what happens over here? There is maturation of collagen. So what happens in maturation of collagen? So you have your type 3 being replaced by type 1 until a ratio of 4 is to 1 is maintained. The ratio of 4 for type 1 collagen 
4 is to 1 where 4 is type 1 and 1 is type 3 collagen. Now the maximum tensile strength is achieved by around 12 weeks later and this represents your 80% of the uninjured skin strength. Right. Now you can look at this. So this is your collagen uh, remodeling over here. So this is your final phase of your wound healing. So if you look at the stages, hemostasis, inflammation, proliferation, remodeling. Please remember this sequence and then you need to remember your important cells. So in your inflammation, the early phase, the hero is your neutrophils. In case of your late phase of inflammation, the hero is your macrophages. Now you have your proliferation. Now proliferation, the main hero is your fibroblast. And in case of your remodeling, the main hero is your collagen. Over here, your type 1 collagen is replacing type 3 until a ratio of 4 is to 1 is achieved. Right. Now regarding your... Now let's move uh, ahead in your wound healing chapter with some important uh, points regarding your wound closure and healing and other infection. So the classification of wound closure and healing, you have your primary. So what is the primary wound? Primary wound are those which are normal wound edges are opposed, which has a normal healing and has your minimal scar. Then you have your secondary wound healing. Now what happens in your secondary wound healing? So what happens over here is wounds are left open. So that means they are not opposed, they are left op op uh, open and now this heals by your granulation tissue contraction and your re-epithelization. So this will generally lead to a poor scar and there would be increased inflammation and proliferation. Now in case of tertiary wound healing, now what happens over here is that wound are initially left open, then edges are opposed later when healing conditions become favorable. Right. So now this is a very important score which has been added in your recent edition of Bailey and Love, which is your National Nosocomial Infection Surveillance Score. So what does it do? It stratifies the surgical wound infection rates by your risk factors. It ranges from 0 to 3, 0 being your lowest SSI risk and 3 being your highest surgical site infection risk. So the question that can be framed from here is itself the NNIS code. They might ask you the full form of it, the first question, right? Then the second question may uh, be asked, what is it used for? So it is used for stratifying the surgical wound infection rate by the risk factor. Now, what is the range? Range is 0 to 3, right? So the highest sur surgical side infection risk is denoted by the score 1, 2, 3, 4. We might tend to mark 4, but no, it's 0 to 3. So the highest is 3. Now, what are the risk factors included? So first is your contaminated or dirty wound. Second is your AS score of more than 3. So this must have definitely be covered in your anesthesia section. So I'm not touching on it right now. The AS score. And then you have your operative time longer than the expected duration for your similar procedure. Now what is this time longer expected? More than what percentile? That is again a very important question. So it is more than... 75 percentile operative time longer than the expected duration for the similar procedure right so this is about your national nosocomial infection surveillance score now coming down to the another important table right so the importance of this table again cannot be explained each exam one or two questions definitely from this table so you have your u.s center for disease Pre uh, prevention and control surgical wound classification right so the current edition of bailey and love have actually removed your sepsis wound score and the southampton wound grading system right so you guys need to still need to know it from your 27th edition but then this table is very very important right so first regarding your class one class one are your uninfected operative wounds so what happens over here is no inflammation is encountered the respiratory alimentary genital or uninfected urinary tracts are not entered primarily closed and if necessary drained using a closed system now class one are your clean wounds now in case of class two this are your clean contaminated 
So over here, what happens is that respiratory, elementary, genital or urinary tracts are entered, but they are entered under controlled conditions, right? So it is your controlled condition and without usual contamination. Now there is no evidence of infection or major break in technique. Then you have your class 3. Now class 3 is your contaminated. Now what happens in this? So you have your open, fresh, accidental wounds. Now there is a major break in your sterile technique, right? For example, your open cardiac massage or gross pillage from the GI tract incisions in which your acute non purulent inflammation is encountered. So please remember this point regarding your open cardiac massage which is your contaminated wound. Now you have your class 4 which is your dirty. So these are usually your old traumatic wounds with retained devitalized tissue and those that involve existing clinical infection or perforated viscera right so these are your important classes of wound infection clean contaminate clean clean contamin contaminated contaminated and dirty right so one important question if need to be framed from here open cardiac massage open cardiac massage is your contaminated wound now coming down to the other principles of wound management so it includes your preparation preparation would include your antibiotic prophylaxis tetanus prophylaxis, adequate analgesia and wound irrigation. Then you have the wound itself, which will include your early debridement and irrigation, exploration, repair of structures, hemostasis. Then your closure. Now this closure would be including your skin closure without tension, consider reconstructive options, suture choice, consider drains and optimal dressing. And you have your follow up, which is your removal of sutures or splints physiotherapy, monitoring for complications and scar management. So these are your principles of wound management. Now you must be thinking what is the importance of this table. So friends, they might just ask you questions from here by directly asking you like a uh, question being framed which of the following is the principle not included in the principle of wound management or which of the following is part of your principles of wound management by using all of the above statement so you need to remember this basic and actually this basic is going to help you to solve almost all sort of clinical scenarios that can actually be asked from it now regarding your tetanus prone wounds so this is a new addition in your recent edition of Bailey and Love so you have your tetanus prone wound now what are those like puncture type injuries in a contaminated environment then you have bites compound fractures containing foreign bodies and wounds or burns with systemic sepsis now in case of high risk tetanus prone wound you have heavy contamination uh, example with soil or manure and you have wound requiring surgery with more than six hour delay and then you have your extensive devitalized tissue so this are your example of uh, tetanus prone wound so you need to remember the high risk R which is required your 6 hour delay extensive devitalized tissue and heavy contamination in case of tetanus prone wounds and tetanus prone wounds are your wounds are burned with systemic sepsis containing foreign bodies compound fractures bite and puncture type injuries in your contaminated environment now moving down to the another important uh, addition to your Bailey and Love 20th edition is your post exposure management for tetanus prone wound. So if you look over here, now those age 11 years or older and have received an adequate priming course of tetanus vaccine with the last dose within 10 years, you would not be requiring pro prophylaxis in either of your categories of your clean wound tetanus prone or high risk tetanus prone wound. And the later treatment would include your further doses that is required. Now, children aged 5 to 10 years who have received priming course and preschool booster now again would not be requiring and children under 5 years who have received an adequate priming dose again you would not be requiring a post exposure management right now in case of received adequate priming course of tetanus vaccine but the last dose more than 10 years now if it is a clean wound 
it is not required whereas it is a tetanus prone you would require an immediate reinforcing dose of vaccine and if it is a high risk tetanus prone you would be requiring an immediate reinforcing dose of vaccine and one dose of human tetanus immunoglobin at a different site now similarly children aged 5 to 10 years who have received an adequate priming course but no preschool booster would again not be requiring anything for your clean wound but for your tetanus prone and high risk tetanus prone there would be immediate reinforcing of the vaccine and in case of high risk uh, tetanus prone wounds you would be requiring to give your human immunoglobulin at a different site now similarly Patients, those who have not received adequate priming course of tetanus vaccine would be requiring, even in case of clean wound, your immediate reinforcing dose of vaccine. And now for tetanus prone and the high risk tetanus prone, you would be requiring a reinforcing dose as well as a immunoglobin at a different site. So now the clinical scenarios that can be framed from this new topic would be basically giving you a clinical scenario where you need to catch hold whether it is a high risk tetanus prone or a tetanus prone wound and then you need to look at the immunization status. Now on the basis of this immunization status they might actually ask you what would be the state of the status of vaccine that needs to be given to the patient. So you need to remember this two important tables regarding your tetanus wound. Now, this is again a recent addition in your Bailey and Love. So, yes, this is a hemolymphatic uh, collection which is known as the moral lavalle lesions, right? So, there is what happens over here. There is disruption of the perforating vascular lymphatic vessels resulting in your hemolymphatic collection between the fascial plane. So, this is your moral lavalle lesions right so now moving down to the next important concept that is of your degloving now you need to remember degloving is your avulsion of skin and subcutaneous fat so the question that is framed option a skin option b sub skin and subcutaneous fat option c subcutaneous fat option d no. the answer would be skin and subcutaneous fat so that is your degloving injury from the underlying fascia uh, muscle or the bone that is the avulsion of skin and the subcutaneous fat now moving down to the next uh, concept before that so this is the degloving injury of the right little and the right, uh, ring finger so they might actually ask you uh, image based question like this put an image based question and ask you the following is uh, showing your avulsion of skin, skin and subcutaneous tissue and subcutaneous tissue from the fascial planes or, and the fascial plane. So you need to remember that degloving is your skin and subcutaneous from the underlying fascia muscle or bone. Now again important diagram or the image based question that is being asked over here they might actually ask you to identify this so this is your negative pressure wound therapy now this is usually done at the pressure of 125 mm of hg right now what does it do it helps to draw the wound edge together removes the exudate reduce the edema and it promotes the granulation tissue formation now it is contraindicated in case of your exposed vessels malignancy, untreated osteomyelitis, necrotic tissue and non-enteric and unexplored fistula. So these are your important points that you need to remember with your negative pressure wound therapy. Now another important concept or question that is asked is regarding your compartment syndrome. So again they would actually give you a clinical based scenario say a patient has undergone a fracture and you are a resident going to the wards in the evening based round and the patient complains of pain you find that the pain is out of proportion there is palpable pulse and pain on passive stretch so what could be your next step right or what would be the treatment of the patient so first you need to make a diagnosis in such cases it is usually a case of compartment syndrome so the most common cause being the fracture and you need to remember that it can actually also occur in your open as well as closed fractures now the threshold for fasciotomy is your pressure of less than 30 mm hg now when you're talking about the clinical features which i explained in the example that i was giving you so you need to remember 
pulselessness is not an early sign it is actually an extremely late sign so this is normally our source of confusion that we would be thinking that it is a compartment syndrome pulselessness has to be there no pulselessness is your late sign so the main in initial signs are usually pain out of proportion and your pain due to passive stretch right so the treatment would be your fasciotomy now at this point if the question actually asks you which of the following is the next step and they put in the option removal of the cast which was given for the fracture my dear friend the first step would be yes you would remove the cast and then you would be going for the fasciotomy so you need to see what is the next step what is the best step according to the options and the question and answer now regarding your fasciotomy so lower limb is decompressed via your two inches so one is your medial longitudinal and second is your lateral longitudinal incision now in case of your medial longitudinal incision it is one to two post centimeter posterior to the medial border of tibia and decompresses superficial and deep compartment now in case of your lateral longitudinal incision you have your two centimeter lateral to the anterior tibial border decompressing the perineal and the anterior compartment right so please remember the treatment for your compartment syndrome is fasciotomy and the most common cause is actually your fracture now another important question that is frame is your necrotizing fasciitis first important point that you need to remember is that it is a polymicrobial infection yes monomicrobial may occur but you need to remember it as polymicrobial now severe rapidly progressing infection of your soft tissue and fascia so what it is severe progressive rapid infection of the soft tissue and the fascia now this is associated with a significant morbidity and mortality now this important table is going to give you all the clinical clues that the examiner might be wanting to ask you to know that you know necrotizing fasciitis or not so the local symptoms would include your unusual pain erythema edema warm crepitus blisters graze discharge fixed staining necrosis and gangrene and you have your systemic which is your fever tachycardia tachypnea shock coagulopathy multi organ failure so these are your signs and symptoms of your necrotizing fasciitis so look for this characteristics specifically your dish water pus in order to diagnose your necrotizing fasciitis now the most common comorbidity associated with it is your diabetes mellitus and the treatment would be by your iv antibiotics and the need of your urgent surgical debridement right so this were your few important points regarding your necrotizing fasciitis now next important concept comes of your pressure also so this is an image based uh, question which can be formed they might just ask you giving this image and ask you regarding the various description or the stages or they might ask you regarding the most common site so if you look at over here so the us national pressure injury advisory panel staging of pressure injury stage 1 is your non blanchable erythema of the intact skin now stage 2 is your partial thickness skin loss with exposed dermis stage 3 is your full thickness skin loss now stage 4 would be your full thickness skin and tissue loss now there's unstageable full thickness pressure injury that is obscured full thickness skin and tissue loss and then you have your deep tissue pressure injury which is your persistent non blanchable deep red maroon or purple discoloration right so this are your us national pressure injury advisory panel staging of your pressure injuries now the common sites for pressure injuries and also so if you are asked please mark ischium Right, it is much more common than your greater trochanter as given in your textbook of daily and law so at your fmg level it is important that you follow your daily and law now this prevention starts with assessing risk 
using a validated score to support your clinical judgment so now what are this validated scores another important mcq since there are a group of three please remember wherever you find a group of three mark that as an important question because they might just ask as a, an add another option and give ask you which of the following is not right so this includes your braden scale waterloo sc uh, score and norton risk assessment score right so the prevention starts with assessing the risk using a validated score to support a clinical judgment such as your such as your braden scale waterloo score and norton risk assessment scale now coming down to the management algorithm for the keloids so the recent bailey and love has given two beautiful diagrams depicting the management of your keloids and your hypertrophic scar so we need to know this so if you, let's follow this table now if it is a minor keloid that is red or raised you could give a silicon gel or sheathing plus or minus intralesional scotico steroids now following which you would need to give your fractional or pulse dye laser therapy and that would be followed by your patient counseling regarding the recurrence rate and expectation and if still does not resolve you would be requiring a surgical excision with adjuvant like silicon gel or sheeting or intralesional corticosteroids or both or radiotherapy or you have alternate therapies like bleomycin mitomycin and imikimod in case of your major or high risk keloid you would give an intralesional corticosteroid followed by your 5 fluorouracil plus intralesional corticosteroid and now then you follow the same model which is a fraction of pulse dye laser therapy patient counseling regarding your recurrence rate and expectation and surgical excision with the adjuvant when now adjuvant drugs include what let's revise bleomycin mitomycin c and imucinamide so this is itself can be again asked a question again a group of three so they might just ask you what are the alternate which of the following is not a part of alternate therapy for the treatment of keloid now this is regarding your management of the hypertrophic scar so immature hypertrophic scar apply preventive algorithm that is a silicon gel or sheeting now if persist for more than one month treat as linear hypertrophic scar followed by your fractional laser therapy now in case of a linear hypertrophic scar you would go for a silicon gel or a sheeting for two months now then you would repeat monthly intralesional corticosteroid injection followed by your fractional laser therapy and pressure therapy now in case of severe scar you would be requiring a surgical excision corticosteroid 5 fluorouracil or alternative therapy and then you have your surgical excision plus post operative silicon gel or sheeting now if it is a widespread burn that is a hypertrophic red or red then again admission to a specialty burn unit you would have a silicon gel or sheeting pressure garments and or an and or you can use an onion extract cream followed by your fractional laser therapy combination of alternative therapy so the purpose of sharing this chart is that they can actually ask you which of the following is the next step they might just give you a sequence like for example in case of keloid they might just give you uh, the patient had a major high risk keloid and has undergone intralesional cortic and has been given intralesional corticosteroid now what will be your next step pulse dye laser therapy surgical excision silicon gel or 5 fluorouracil plus intralesional corticosteroid so in that case your answer would be 5 fluorouracil plus intralesional corticosteroids so this were your few important points with respect to your hypertrophic scar and keloid now coming down to the some additional concepts of uh, from this shock uh, section which i couldn't include over there uh, some important definitions which is your shock index so shock index is your heart rate and your systolic blood pressure then you have your mean modified shock index the modified shock index is your heart rate by mean arterial pressure simple basics but do not mess it up right now you have your sepsis bundle so this sepsis bundle is also known as your resuscitation bundle now it is usually needed when when you have severe sepsis septic shock and your lactate levels are more than four so the value needs to be remembered and it is usually done within six hours 
so you have this new addition which is your sepsis 6 so you give 3 to the patient what are you going to give to the patient you're going to give fluids you IV fluids you're going to give IV antibiotics and you are to going to give oxygen and monitor urine output now in sepsis 6 the three components you are given to the patient and the three you are taking from the patient so what are you taking from the patient you're going to take from the patient your blood culture full blood count and lactate so these are your six components of your sepsis 6 right now some important questions which are invariably asked is regarding source so what is so source is your systemic inflammatory response now it is presence of two of the three criteria so what are your criteria number one hyperthermia hyperthermia value need to be remembered 38 degree hypothermia less than 36 degree tachycardia more than 90 per minute no beta blocker tachypnea more than 20 per minute then you have your white cell count more than 12 into 10 to the power 9 per liter or less than 4 into 10 to the power 9 per liter right so that is your sepsis now what uh, that is your source so now what is sepsis sepsis is source plus a documented source of infection right so please do not confuse sepsis with source and this criteria are very 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 important right this is again a five star point which is invariably asked almost in all the exams now what is your severe sepsis or the sepsis syndrome it is sepsis with evidence of failure of one or more organs that is respiratory acute respiratory distress syndrome cardiovascular that is your septic shock following compromise of the cardiac function and fallen peripheral vascular resistance renal that is usually acute tubular necrosis hepatic blood coagulation systems or central nervous system right now in addition to this a very recent score which was also the question of your last fmg exam was also asked again in your need pg and definitely can be uh, repeated the components respiratory rate more than 22 why you need to remember this because you would actually easily confuse over here more than 20 right so please do not confuse so respiratory rate over here now in SERS, it is more than 20 per minute so this is one of the most confusing areas which you need to avoid then you have your altered mental status and systolic blood pressure less than 100 mm of hg now if you look over here in case of SERS, there is no such value of hypotension now people actually have made mistakes in SERS by including your systolic blood pressure as a component my dear friends there is no component of your systolic blood pressure in your source it is hyperthermia tachycardia hypo uh, and the white cell count right so this were your few important points with your gen core general surgery so if you have any doubts please do let me know now in your core general surgery which what i think you need to do again is one important is your teg so you can actually follow your game youtube channel right game pg app youtube channel where i have uploaded this video for teg now apart from this in your code general surgery there are questions asked from perioperative care and the post-operative care which are actually covered in your relevant sections from the medicine and the other allied subjects right so do give it a read do give it a read but the main basics of your cold general surgery is usually limited to your metabolic response to surgery and then you have from your shock and wound healing and hence i have focused over here right so now let's move on to the next section which is your basic surgical skills now prior to that if you guys have any doubt please do let me know else i'll start the session on your basic surgical skills now so i'll wait for any of your doubts if you have right now please let me know Right, so I'll proceed. Yeah. Now, now the purpose of uh, using this basic surgical skills is that now this exam boards are becoming much more oriented or practically oriented given the questions which you come across in your daily uh, scenarios of your internships. Right. So let's uh, try to 
incorporate over here the most important concepts that are actually asked or can be asked. Now, first question incision. Now, this is a fresh question from your last sessions of, of your FMG and NEED. What they had done over there was they just gave you this H incision, right? And they asked what was the operation done for the patient, right? So, hence the questions are being framed from this. So, you need to know this important uh, diagram from your Bayliander. So if you look over here, A, what is A? So A is your sternotomy. Now you must, you will be reading it in cases of thoracic trauma, you would be requiring to do a sternotomy or in case of a retrosternal goiter, you might be requiring a sternotomy in cardiac bypass procedures, you usually require a sternotomy to be done. Then you have your B which is your peri areola now this is usually done for your uh, removal of your breast lump lesions then again you have your c if you look over here the c now this is your infra mammary now this infra mammary is again used in your removal of your breast tumors right then you have your D, which is your subcostal. Now, this subcostal is also known as your cultured incision. Now, what is this cultured incision used for? Yes, it is used for your open cholecystectomy or your CBD exploration. Now, then you have your E, which is your paramedian, right? Paramedian incision. Then you have your F, which is your transverse incision. Right. So initially, paramedian incision has been used for performing a left-sided colon surgery, not mainly performed by midline surgeries. But you need to remember all these incisions, right? Now G is incision is your peri umbilical incision right now h now this h which i was discussing was actually your mcburney's incision i'm very sorry i think i mentioned it as your hernia no it was mcburney's incision which is used for your appendectomy yeah then you have your i which is used in your cesarean section which is your fan and steel incision now you have your this K. So this is again used during your thoracotomy, which is known as your clamshell thoracotomy. Now this L is your chevron rooftop incision. Now we use it usually for your pulse procedure. We may even use it for gastrectomy. Now M is your midline. Now this is your most commonly used incisions when you are going to do an emergency laparotomy right and this n sorry this n is your inguinal incision which was actually asked in your recent fmg exam by asking you what was the operative procedure done and some people said they were actually asking you what was the diagnosis so it was done for your inguinal hernia sorry please do not get it confused by your h right this h is your mcburney's incision which is used for your appendectomy now Coming down to the next is the use of blades. Now, any surgery for giving skin incision, you require blade, blades. Now, the skin incision are usually given your lines of the least, uh, least tension, like relaxed skin tension line. So, now this blade. Now, if you look at this blade, this is a 23 number blade, this is a 22, this is 15, this is 11, and this is 10. Now, this 11 blade is used for doing arterial. Tommy, <coughs> excuse me. Right, so this 11 blade is used for doing arteriotomy. Now, 15 blade is being used for your minor surgical procedures. Right, and you have also your 11 blade being used for your abscess drainage 
Now since this are your specifically your abscess drainage is a very commonly procedure which you would be coming across the surgical posting and your minor surgical procedures you would be actually assisting a lot of them or even might get an opportunity to do a few of them like excisions of lipoma so you definitely need to remember the blades being used 15 for your minor surgical procedures and for abscess drainage you have your 11 and this is also used for your arteriotomy now another important concept is regarding your sutures right so your suture materials desired characteristics include easy to handle predictable behavior in the tissues predictable tensile strength sterile glides through tissues easily secure knotting ability inexpensive minimal tissue reaction non capillary non allergic non carcinogenic now on the basis of physical structure they may be a monofilament or multifilament or braided now monofilament is smooth tend to slide and difficult to knot in case of multifilament they are easier to knot now the surface area is around thousand times so capillary action causes interstices where bacteria can lodge now regarding your strength the constituent material thickness and response to tissue determine the strength of the suture now absorbable sutures usually decay of strength with time in case of non-absorbable biological lose strength with time whereas in case of synthetic non-absorbable they retain their strength right so these are your few important characteristics of sutures which you need to remember and now regarding your vascular anastomosis if you're doing a vascular anastomosis you would be requiring a smooth non-absorbable and a non-elastic in case of uh, biliary anastomosis you would be requiring an absorbable suture now why not a non-absorbable suture because that non-absorbable suture itself be uh, forming a nidus which could be a predisposing factor for your infection and for your boil anastomosis we you may use actually polyglacline pds or polypropylene which depending upon the surgeon's choice now this is a very important concept over here regarding your absorb absorption rates which has been frequently asked so polyglactylene uh, absorption rate is around 60 to 90 days polydioxanone is hydrolysis minimum at 90 days and complete absorption at 180 days and then you have your polyglycoperon which is absorption uh, happening at 90 to 120 days right now these are the types of needles so please remember this now in this i would remember ask you all to remember the half circle which is usually used for your gi tract compound curve used for your oral cavity your j needle is usually used for your lap foot closure and your one fourth circle is usually used for eye right so these are your few important points regarding your needle so this basic surgical skills are something which you are going to come across in your daily day to day life in your surgery posting so just keep your eyes open and keep looking at them and that is going to help you to solve actually most of the questions from your basic surgical skills that is asked now this are regarding your sutures right so this is your uh, showing your various type of sutures uh, techniques right so the first is your interrupted suture technique now then we have your continuous suture technique so please remember this diagram so these are your practical based things which you must have you've been a lot of sutures in your trauma postings or in your surgical residency posting so you just need to remember them so this could this are the form of your images which can actually be in R. so if you look over here interrupted over here there is a decent gap now right and each is a different suture now this is the same suture which is actually going continuing like a crisscross crisscross so right this is a continuous suture technique now this is your mattress sutures the first one showing you a vertical mattress and second one showing you a horizontal mattress suture now this is your showing your subcuticular suture technique so the suture techniques can actually be given in your exams like your match the following they might just give you the diagrams and on the other hand they might ask you which of the following is which type of suture technique so please be well versed with it and do not make a mistake in such types of questions as this are actually very easy and practically oriented questions now <coughs> now regarding your knots 
right so these are your various important knots which i would want you all to remember so first is your square knot and your granny knot now if you look over here uh, if you look over here now this one and this one right so if you look at over here the throws are different for this which is your square knot now as for this one it is almost in the same going over the other so this is your granny's knot so i'll again draw it for you all so if you look over here this are in your opposite directions over here right and this are in your same direction so that could be would be an easy way to remember same direction so this is your granny's knot and the Lower one is your surgeon's knot, which would be very easy for you all to remember. So the most important confusion that actually arises from the types of knot is the square knot versus your granny's knot. So the trick to remember over here, which I would ask you all to do is to remember that is in the same direction and over here it is not in the same throws, right? So this is your square knot and the granny knot. Now regarding your abdominal wall closure, the material that we use nowadays as per the recent edition of Bailey and Love 20th edition is your 20 PDS and the interval between the sutures should be 0.5 cm. The earlier gap concept of 1 cm is no longer recommended. They are saying small bites which is your 0.5 cm. Now this is again another important concept regarding your diathermy. So if you look over here. This is an example of your monopolar diathermy and this is an example of your bipolar diathermy. Now another very important way to remember bipolar diathermy, if you would have gone to the OT, you must have definitely seen bipolar uh, uh, diathermy is usually something around like this, like a, a fork tongue where you need to uh, hold the tissues like this, right? So I would actually share a bipolar picture soon with you all in the Game PJ YouTube channel so that you are able to understand that. But for the time being, please remember this particular concept of your bipolar and the monopolar diathermy. This particular diagrams can actually be just straightforward thrown to you at the exam, trying to know which of the following is a monopolar diathermy, which of the following is a bipolar diathermy. Now regarding the comparisons of the cutting and the coagulation of the tissue using diathermy. So in case of cutting, it is a low voltage current, right? In case of coagulation, it is a high voltage current. Then cutting is continuous, that is current is on 100% of the time when used. Now in case of coagulation, it is interrupted. Current flows 6% of the time and off for the remaining 94%. So very important table differentiating your cutting and coagulation where you can actually be just frame your which of the following is a true or false statement. Now energy is concentrated over a small area in case of cutting whereas energy is dispersed over a large area in case of coagulation. Now tissue is heated rapidly to a higher temperature causing vaporization of tissue and thereby resulting in cutting tissue. Whereas in case of coagulation the modulated current allows the tissue to cool slightly so the tissue heating is actually slower than the cutting mode right so this causes a dehydration effect which is your loss of cellular fluid and protein denaturation right which results in the coagulation of tissue now dehydration is not as effective as vaporization or cutting tissue but is ideal for hemostasis now bleeding is stopped by combination of the distortion of the walls of blood vessel, coagulation of the plasma proteins and the stimulation of your clotting cascade. Now in case of cutting there is minimal lateral spread and the collateral damage whereas in case of coagulation there is an extensive lateral spread. Now cutting divides tissue by generating sparks which to the tissue and this is the most efficient when the tip is held just above the tissue <coughs> so the cutting is basically dividing by generating spark so now this which are to the tissue and the most efficient when the tip is held actually just above the tissue now in case of coagulation similar to cutting and work best when held just above the tissue with no contact or minimal contact with the tissue. Now use is clean cut of tissue and in case of coagulation is using coagulation and achieving hemostasis. So now these are your wave diagrams using uh, for your cutting 
and your coagulation using your monopolar diathermy right now coming down to the drain so this is your corrugated rubber drain now you have opened drain using a corrugated drain so this is your corrugated drain right then you have your closed drain system which is your suction drain over here right suction drain and this is your abdominal drain i think this is not being shown over here because of the thing so basically this is like a bag which is attached over here and this is your tubing which comes over here right so this is your non-section drain which is usually used to drain your abdominal cavity so what are the current role of drain placement in the non-gi surgery so you actually avoid the routine drain placement thyroid surgery breast lumpectomy and in inguinal hernia repair and you consider your routine drain placement in case of your radical and modified radical neck dissection parted surgery ulcerative dissection inguinal lymph uh, uh, inguinal lymph adenectomy and your ventral hernia repair in your obese patients right and the current role of placement in your gi surgery you avoid routine in case of colonic small bowel resection hepatic resection and cholecystectomy and you consider routine drain placement following esophageal major pancreatic resection and you use the selective drains in case of rectal surgery and gastric resection uh, gastric resection so now they can actually ask you a question from here right which of the following surgeries are, uh, are usually recommended to avoid routine drain placement during surgery colonic small bowel resection cholecystectomy rectal surgery so there is actually a selective use of drains in case of rectal surgery whereas to avoid routine drain placement in case of colonic surgery small bowel resections hepatic resection and cholecystectomy right now a few important concepts regarding your minimal assess surgery now, so the advantage of minimal assess surgery includes your decrease in wound size so there has been questions from uh, formed and framed from here where they have asked you what of the following are the advantages or the disadvantages of your minimal assess surgery right so decrease in wound size decrease in wound pain reduction in wound infection dehiscence bleeding herniation and nerve entrapment improve mobility decrease wound trauma decrease head loss and improve visual visualization now the limitations of minimal assess surgery includes your lack of 3d vision loss of tactile feedback hemostasis extraction of large specimens learning curve cost and your reliance on new technology right so they can just simply ask which of the following is not a limitation of minimal assess surgery and they might actually give you decreased heat loss so decreased heat loss is actually an advantage of minimal assess surgery right now the preparation for minimal assess surgery would include your overall fitness which includes your cardiac arrhythmia lung function medications allergies previous surgeries or oncological interventions such as scars adhesions then body habitus like obesity skeletal deformity then you have your normal coagulation thromboprophylaxis informed consent operative difficulty is predicted when you have your possible with your appropriate risk model and appropriate theater time and facilities are available so these are your basic preparation for your minimal assess surgery now the basic principles include your meticulous care in creation of your pneumoperitoneum controlled dissection of your adhesions then you have your adequate exposure of the operative field avoidance and control of bleeding avoidance of organ injury avoidance of diathermy damage and vigilance in the post operative period so this are your some of the basic principles of your minimal assess surgery so again the questions have been formed from this table which may actually ask you which of the following is principle as all of the above and which of the following is not an advantage which of the following is not a disadvantage so now this is a very important concept which I would want you all to discuss. So this is your laparoscopic access to the abdomen using your modified Hansen's technique. So if you look over here, the first step you can see over here, the umbilicus is being everted, right? Then you give a peri umbilical incision. So you see over here, this is your umbilicus being everted. Then you give your peri umbilical incision, right? And then you have your junction of the umbilicus and the linear alba is identified right following by which a curved 
uh, based hemostat is inserted to break the peritoneum and then you have your blunt tip trocar entry so this is your basically steps of creation of your initial uh, pneumoperitoneum now as i had mentioned that it was an open technique so definitely there is a closed technique the closed technique is your very needle or the visual entry so one important question that is actually asked is your very needle so very needle if you look over here this is an image of the very needle and this is your process by which your very needle is inserted now an important question that is framed from your very needle section is regarding your confirmant confirmant of your intraperitoneal place, placement so first you do it by your hanging drop method so you drop is placed in the hub of the needle and on elevating the abdominal wall the resultant loss of your intraabdominal pressure is causing the resulting drop emptying into the abdominal cavity now there is a free flow saline a free flow of saline into the peritoneal cavity and on aspiration there is no return of the fluid bowel content or any blood and the abdominal pressure is maintained in less than 10 mm of hg so this is with respect to your very needle placement and regarding your most common cause of conversion to open surgery is your bleeding right and the risk factors that predisposes to bleeding include your liver disease impacting on production of your vitamin k dependent clotting factors inflammatory condition like acute cholecystitis or diabetic colitis then you have your patients on anticoagulants and coagulation defect so this are your risk factors that predispose to bleeding right so this are your important uh, points with respect to your basic surgical skills and your minimal assist surgery i think apart from this over here what i would want you all to know is regarding your robotic system so you have mainly the your da vinci robotic system and another robotic system image that has been uh, not image another robotic system that has been introduced is your versius robotic system right so you guys need to remember your this two robotic system so i'll just write it down for you which is your da vinci and versius robotic system so you need to know the images of it so this images have again also already been shared by me in my instagram channel which is your your dot surgery body as well as at the game pg app so you can actually take a look at them right so this were your important points with respect to your basic surgical skills now coming down to the another important chapter in your general surgery which is your nutrition right so in nutrition i would begin with your nutrix score what is nutrix score it is your nutrition assessment and critically ill now the variables which are included in your nutrix score includes your age apache 2 sofa score number of comorbidities days from hospital admission to icu admission so the variables on nutrix score are age apache score sofa number of comorbidities and number of days from hospital admission to your icu admission so a score of 0 to 4 is giving you a low malnutrition risk whereas score of 5 to 9 gives you a high malnutrition risk now what is your metabolic response to your starvation we had actually read about your metabolic response to injury and stress so what happens in starvation there is low plasma insulin each and every point of this table is important they might ask you which of the following is a metabolic not a metabolic response to starvation so you need to remember this low plasma insulin high plasma glucagon hepatic glycogenolysis protein catabolism so please understand body is starving so body stores are going to try to compensate for it so as a result of which protein is going to be catabolized right there is going to be formation of new source of glucose gluconeogenesis a form of your amino acids right lipolysis breakdown of your fat stores that is the mobilization of your fat stores increase fat oxidation and overall decrease in protein and carbohydrate oxidation adaptive ketogenesis and reduction in resting energy expenditure uh, that is from approximately 25 to 30 to 15 to 20 kilo calorie kg per day so this is your metabolic response to your starvation now 
in contrast the exact opposite or somewhat opposite is occurring in your metabolic response to your trauma and sepsis now you need to remember there is one particular important point which is actually characteristically seen in this metabolic uh, response to starvation which is your adaptive ketogenesis so this is going to be your clinching point towards your metabolic response to your starvation now going towards your metabolic response to trauma and sepsis so they have your increased counter regulatory hormones adrenaline noradrenaline cortisol glucagon and growth hormone now you have your increased energy requirements increase nitrogen requirement so it can actually increase energy up to 40 kilocalorie per kg per day insulin resistance and glucose intolerance preferential oxidation of lipids increase gluconeogenesis and protein catabolism loss of adaptive ketogenesis so you can see there is loss of adaptive ketogenesis in your metabolic response to trauma and sepsis whereas in case of starvation there was adaptive ketogenesis occurring so this is actually your one of the most commonly asked question over here now you have your fluid retention with associated hypoalbuminemia so these are your few important points with respect to your metabolic response to trauma and sepsis and your starvation now regarding the evaluation of nutrition so first you have your nutrition assessment now, how do you do this nutrition assessment so they would be it would be by your clinical history body weight anthropometry indirect calorimetry body composition analysis and biochemical analysis now then you decide the criteria to initiate support so when would you be initiating a support so if you have your past medical history that is severe undernutrition chronic disease or you have involuntary loss of 10 to 15 usual body weight within six months or five percent in one month so they are saying 10 to 15 percent in six months or more than five percent in one month right or you have expected blood loss more than 500 ml during surgery or you have your bmi less than 18.5 kg per meter square or there is failure to thrive on pediatric growth curve or you have your serum albumin level less than 3 gram per deciliter or transferrin that is less than 200 nanogram per deciliter or the patient is unable to meet your caloric requirement within your 7 to 10 days pre-op or catabolic disease so these are your conditions where you would be initiating your nutrition support now so in this you will actually check if the patient has a fully or a partial dysfunctional gi tract now the answer to this question can be a yes or a no so if the patient is having a fully or a partial functional gi tract then you will check can the patient take oral route is it possible is it safe now if the answer is yes then you uh, sorry if the oral route is uh, possible then you will give the patient oral nutrition which is initiating enteral nutrition only if 60 percent of the required needs be met for more than 10 days whereas now if the oral route is impossible then you would be going for your enteral nutrition now what are the advantages of enteral nutrition you have decreased infections entering blood flow physiological and there is preservation of your gut associated lymphoid tissue now the complications of enteral nutrition include your tube related now tube related it could be your malposition displacement blockage breakage and leakage now gastrointestinal includes your bloating diarrhea constipation aspiration and abdominal cramp metabolic includes electrolyte uh, disturbances and infective could be exogenous and endogenous now this enteral nutrition if it is used for less than four weeks then you would be going for a nasogastric nasodural or nasojejunal now if the expected use is more, for more than four weeks you would require a gastrostomy or a feeding jejunostomy so these are your few of the clinical indicator so if the clinical scenario is formed where you would be told that the requirement is for more than four weeks then yes you would be actually requiring a gastrostomy or a feeding jejunostomy which can be done in form of endoscopically fluoroscopically or an open surgery now if we come back to the first question again if there is a dysfunctional gi tract then you would be giving a patient parental nutrition now again you see if the nutrition is required for more than one to two weeks then 
you would go for a central line else you can go for a peripheral line now the complications include your refeeding syndrome which is classically seen as hypophosphatemia hypomagnesia overfeeding sepsis pneumothorax venous thrombosis metabolic acidosis cholelithiasis and steatosis right so this is a generalized approach in order to see how to initiate your nutrition support now you have another important tool which is your malnutrition you know uh, Malnutrition universal screening tool. So if you look over here, it includes your component BMI, weight loss in three to six months and your acute disease effect. Now, if you have your overall risk of undernutrition, zero is low, one is medium, two or more is high. In case of zero, you go, go for your routine clinical care. In case of medium, you observe and in case of two or more, you actually treat the patient, right? now. Itself, the definition is important of must. Please remember it is malnutritional universal screening tool. There could be a lot of combination and combinations from where they can actually change this MUST, but you guys need to remember it is malnutrition universal screening tool. Now, coming down to the nutrition part, also is your IV fluid. So, if you look at this table, it is again a VIP or a five star table because now they have asked you compositions out from here. So firstly, you need to remember the sodium and chloride composition is same in case of 0.9% saline, right? Now, another important question that you remember, the pH is your lowest in case of your 5% dextrose. Then you need to remember the composition of your Hartmann solution where you have your sodium 131, chloride being 111, potassium being 5, bicarbonate being 29, calcium being 2, and lactate being your 29 right so this are your few important points respect with respect to the composition of plasma in comparison with your commonly used intrafluid replacement so definitely you guys need to remember point uh, nine percent saline and hartman solution as this are your most commonly fluids used in your clinical practice right now, another important table is regarding your IV cannulas, which are used for transfusion. So again, you need to remember as they have asked you actually image based question by giving you the cannula and asking you what is the size of it or what is the flow of it. So the important ones are green, which is 18 gauge and your flow rate is around 80. Pink is around 20 with the flow rate of being your 54 ml per minute. Blue is your 22. Now flow rate being 33, yellow is 24 with flow rate being your 20 and violet is 26 with the flow rate being your 19 ml per minute. So at least remember your color code, right, which is green for 18, pink 20, blue 22, yellow 24 and violet 26, orange is 14, gray is 16 and white is your 17 G. Now coming to the last point of your nutrition. You have your recommended schedule for monitoring of feeding regimen. I think again, this is a new addition in your Bailey and Love. New addition as in this table is slightly differing from your old table. So wherever possible, it's very important that you guys need to remember the current uh, edition table. So daily regimen observation include pulse, blood pressure, temperature, body weight, fluid balance, including your uh, volume of urine and intestinal losses quantity and type of food consumed if allowed to eat and then you have your plasma levels which includes your sodium blood glucose magnesium and phosphate and liver function test and c-reactive protein now the weekly to fortnightly you have your plasma levels for full blood count calcium zinc copper plasma proteins thiamines triglycerides vitamin b12 and folic acid now three to six monthly you measure ferritin selenium magnesium and 25 hydroxy vitamin d right so this are your few important points which you need to remember regarding the schedule specifically what is done three to six monthly ferritin selenium magnesium and vitamin d and weekly to fortnight you have your folic acid vitamin b12 triglyceride thiamine plasma proteins including albumin calcium and your full blood count so weekly to fortnightly is your full blood count so this is one of the most commonly made mistakes where you tend to mark full blood count daily no full blood count is done weekly to fortnightly so well so this were your few important points 
for nutrition again nutrition itself is a very vast chapter but then these are your few important core topics which have been repeatedly asked which we decided to focus over here and this particular chart of your nutrition which we have dealt over here is actually very very important because the questions are usually framed around this giving you clinical based scenario for which you need to be prepared so now next we shall soon be starting uh, trauma so we'll just take a small break uh, now and then following which we shall begin our discussion with the trauma section Hi friends, so now we'll continue our discussion on uh, trauma section. So I get it, it has been very hectic uh, session so far, a long marathon session, but we'll be trying to focus and doing the same thing. We'll be trying to cover as many points as possible so that this could actually be your one last short video for your revision. So now coming down to trauma discussion, right? So mechanism. So the mechanisms in trauma could actually be your blunt penetrating or combined now the most common mechanism of trauma is your blunt trauma now the knowledge of mechanism actually helps us to detect the covert injury so this is a very important table which is given in your bailey and love which we, which we used to, uh, we need to know right so the first uh, mechanism of injury is your left sided impact from rta so if it is a left sided impact from rta it is going to cause a lateral compression of pelvis and a left sided pneumothorax so these are going to be your obvious injuries now in terms of covert injuries you might have a splenic rupture or an left sided extradural hematoma now when you come down to the flexion distraction lap belt injury so the chances fracture of the lumbar spine or there could be a dislocated knee or a head injury whereas the covert injuries would be your duodenal rupture popliteal artery disruption and your cervical spine fracture now when you talk about your electrocution the obvious injury would be your burn on hand or the patient might have a circulatory collapse whereas your covert injuries would include your posterior dislocation of shoulder now you guys need to remember this word posterior because the examiner would try to confuse you by giving anterior dislocation of the shoulder but the answer would be your posterior dislocation of the shoulder then you have your dashboard impact the obvious injury would be your knee wound and your cobalt injury would be your again posterior dislocation of the hip so these are some of the examples of the cobalt injuries with respect to the mechanism of injury which you need to know now the basics of primary survey even the last fmg had a question based on just this particular table so in order to know the major chunk of trauma do not actually forget the primary survey now your primary survey is actually going to help you solve the most of the questions right so primary survey the aim to identify and manage most life threatening pathologies now it consists of exaggerating external hemorrhage control the small c so if a patient has come down to an emergency and is actively bleeding your first step needs to be to control that bleeding how will you control that bleeding by application of pressure now you would do a compression this compression or this pressure needs to be applied proximal to the place from where the bleeding is occurring and apart from that you may actually apply some hemostatic agents now this hemostatic agents actually altered the coagulation pathways now if it does not control by all this then you can actually apply a tunicate now for example if there is a bleeding from this point you can apply a tunicate over here now if you apply a tunicate over here it is going to definitely stop the bleeding but at the same time there is a risk of ischemia so in out in order to counteract that it has to be a time controlled tunicate application right now coming down to the airway with cervical spine cut oh sorry so apart from tunicate if there is not control then definitely you need to do the surgical control for the bleeding now coming down to the second component which is your airway with cervical spine control now what do you need to do in your airway with cervical spine control first if the patient is able to speak to you properly that means definitely there is no compromise in the airway now if there is the first step would be clearing of the blood or the secretions 
now once this clearing is achieved the airway can be secure now if this does not achieve the secure airway then you go down to the next step your next step would be use of your simple airway procedures now simple airway procedures would include your jaw lift chin thrust then it also includes the nasopharyngeal airway oropharyngeal airway now if it still does not then we move down to the advanced airway which includes your endotracheal tube now over here rapid sequence intubation with anesthesia may be required and there may be need of your surgical emergency procedures like your cricothyroidotomy and your tracheostomy so these are your few important points which you need to remember for your exaggerating external hemorrhage and airway with cervical spine control. Now for breathing and ventilation, you need to give the patient oxygen and it is at this time that you need to rem uh, rule out your immediately life-threatening injuries to the patient. You will not wait for the diagnosis to be done and do an x-ray, rather just immediately treat the life-threatening injuries like in case of a tension pneumothorax. You're not, if, you, if a patient comes down to you in your clinical scenario, you're not waiting for an x-ray to be done. What you're going to do, you're just immediately going to decompress. So we'll be discussing this when we'll be discussing some important points of your thoracic trauma. Now coming down to the circulation. Now what is the initial aim? It is to maintain the blood supply to the vital organ. Now it can be achieved with target systolic blood pressure 70 to 90 mm of Hg. But if there is a head injury, then your blood pressure required is more than 90 mm of Hg. Now, small boluses, boluses of fluid should be administered to achieve this target. And this can be seen with the palpable radial pulse. Now, why do we not give excessive fluid? Because if we give excessive fluid, there would be hemodilution increase coagulopathy and increase risk of your acute respiratory distress syndrome right now the massive transfusion protocol is your one pack red cell one ffp and one platelets now another important concept that we need to remember is regarding your tranexamic acid now it is an antifibrolytic drug which is seen to reduce mortality and morbidity in your blood as well as your penetrating trauma now what is the dose? It is usually 1 gram IV over 8 minutes followed by 1 gram, uh, sorry, 1 gram over 10 minutes followed by 1 gram IV over your 8 hours. Now, what are the indications for it? Indications would be systolic blood pressure less than 110 mm of Hg and pulse more than 110 mm per minute. Now, it is said that it should be ideally given within 1 hour and maximum within your three hours of injury so this all are your data as per your Barry and love 20th edition right now regarding your uh, thoracic trauma specifically when it comes down to the breathing uh, part we have this deadly dozen of the chest injury now prior to that i think i missed on the discussion for the disability and exposure so the disability would include your glasgow coma scale assessment score which would we shall be discussing in detail and when we discuss your head uh, injury in your new neurosurgery section and apart from that we go for your afpu scale so you need to remember afpu what is afpu that is a for alert v for verbal response now p for a response to pain and u is for unresponsive right so these are your uh regarding your disability assessment apart from that you also go for your pupillary assessment right so pupillary assessment would be seeing whether the pupils are dilated or constricted and reacting normal to light and exposure is usually done in a controlled environment to prevent hypothermia so these are your basics of your primary survey which itself is a potential to be asked a direct mcq or they might actually give you a clinical based scenario and you need to answer from this which of the following is the next step right so we've done with the circulation now regarding your deadly dozen of chest injury so they are basically two types immediately life-threatening and potentially life-threatening now what i have done is over here on the left side which is my this side you have your injuries as classified as per the 20th edition of your bailey and love and this which is handwritten is from your ATLS 10th edition. Now, grossly they are same except 
one major difference that the flail chest is considered to be immediate life threatening in case of your Bailey and Love, whereas your ATL is current edition says flail chest to be potentially life threatening injury. Right. So at your level, now most of the questions that have been framed on in your MCQ books are as per your Bailey and Love. 27th edition and even 20th edition has been mentioning that so you need to actually see and answer according to the option now if you are actually stuck in a situation where you need to answer whether as per 28th edition or as per the 10th edition i would obviously advise you all to answer as per the 10th edition as the atls guidelines are universally and widely acceptable right now the immediate life threatening injuries include your airway obstruction tension pneumothorax pericardial tamponade open pneumothorax and massive hemothorax if you're following bailey and love it will be flail chest as it will be tracheobronchial injuries now potentially life threatening injuries include your aortic injuries tracheobronchial injuries myocardial contusion rupture of diaphragm esophageal injuries and your pulmonary contusion now let's take a look and uh, important points regarding each of this injuries now first we have your tension pneumothorax so what is the tension pneumothorax so there is a one-way air leak now what has as a result of which what happens is that mediastinum is displaced to the opposite side that decreasing the venous return and compressing your opposite lung now the patient usually presents as restless tachypnea dis uh, with dyspnea and distended neck vents and what you require is immediate decompression now even the needle thoracosynthesis earlier concept of second intercostal space is no more use now this is in collaboration with your current edition of your Bailey and Love as well as your ATLS 10th edition so it's done in your fifth intercostal space and even the insertion of ICD is done in your fifth intercostal space now this is your triangle of safety the boundaries I have been asked which is posteriorly by your latimus dorsi anteriorly by your lateral border of your pectoralis major and inferiorly perpendicular to nipple going to back over the mid axillary line so these are your few important points regarding your tension pneumothorax now when it comes down to your cardiac tamponade you have your cvp elevation decline in arterial pressure with tachycardia and muffled heart sound so all patients with penetrating injury anywhere near heart plus shock consider to have cardio per cardiac injury until unless proven otherwise now there is no role of cardio pericardiosynthesis and immediate treatment is your operative treatment now open pneumothorax it is more than three centimeter defect equilibrium between the intrathoracic and the atmospheric pressure now if the opening is more than two-third diameter of trachea air preferentially through the defect and as a result of which air accumulates now what is the treatment the sterile occlusive dressing on the three sides please remember you will not close all the sides if you close all the sides what is going to happen is that it is actually eventually going to lead to tension pneumothorax now chest tube the side is remote from the injury site so these are your few important points with respect to your open pneumothorax now massive hemothorax the most common cause is your blunt trauma now bleeding occurs from your intercostal vessels now patient may present with hemorrhagic shock flat neck vents or unilateral absence of breath sound now correcting hypovolemic shock insertion of intercostal drain and intubation would uh, be your main line of treatment and please remember that there is no role of clamping chest tube to the tamponade and sometimes if necessary a second drain may be put so these are your few important points with respect to your massive hemothorax so these are usually your casualty incidents where you need to take the clues from all these respective points and answer your question there is no point in mugging up this it's better that you try to analyze visualize and see what you would have done in those scenarios and it would make your question solving easier right and then one last important thoracic trauma which i would want to discuss is regarding your flail chest which is fracture of two or more adjacent ribs in two or more places and it can also occur if there is a costochondral separation of single rib from thorax again this definition is from your atls 10th edition guideline now there is a paradoxical respiration so what happens in paradoxical respiration this flail segment like loose from the chest wall 
so during inspiration the flesh segment will not move out with the rest of the chest wall so when you take an inspiration the chest wall is moving out but in case of the flail chest the paradoxical respiration what is going to happen is that it is drawn inward due to the interthoracic pressure now during expiration the chest recoils so the positive interthoracic pressure which actually push it out so this paradoxical respiration will actually prevent the gaseous exchange and cause your hypoxemia and your treatment would include your administration of humidified oxygen ventilation fluid resuscitation and analgesia right so this were a few important points regarding your general trauma and regarding your thoracic trauma right now coming down to the abdominal trauma you have your first concept which you guys need to remember is regarding your fast so fast is your focus abdominal sonography for trauma which assess the torso in presence of free fluid in the abdomen and e fast is when it extends into the thoracic cavity so if you look over here this is your trauma fast scan which is seeing over the cardiac subsephoid right upper quadrant hepatorenal left upper quadrant splenorenal and suprapubic views now if it is extending into the chest right and the left anterior chest this is your e fast right now important points regarding your fast is it does not reliably detect less than 100 ml of free fluid it does not directly identify injury to your hollow whisker it cannot exclude your penetrating injury and is unreliable for assessment of retroperitoneum so this four important lines can actually come as which of the following is a true or false statement with respect to fast so now regarding your abdominal trauma there are various solid organs which are injured like your kidney liver and spleen now what i'm going to do in this revision session of yours is that i'm going to teach you the generalized approach of your blunt abdominal trauma and a penetrating abdominal trauma so what this is going to do is that it is going to help you to solve most of the questions as the basics would remain same apart from this you would definitely need to re remember the various grade grading of injuries i have not included it in this section so please make sure that you look at the various grading of injuries of liver spleen and kidney for sure now if you look at this approach of your blunt abdominal trauma so first would be your blunt uh, in cases of your blunt abdominal examination of uh, trauma abdominal examination including e fast now if there is peritonitis now if you find features of peritonitis there is no question you take the patient for laparotomy now if you do not find peritonitis patient is stable you go for abdominal ct scan now in abdominal ct scan if you find that there is hollow viscous injury then again you go for your exploratory laparotomy now in case of abdominal CT scan, you do not find any hollow viscous injury. You look for your solid organ injury. Now, if you find a solid organ injury, that is grade 4 or 5, uh, and this grade 4 or 5, then you would actually require exploratory laparotomy, or in some cases specifically, if you're dealing with the splenic injury, you may require a angioembolization. Now, if it is usually grade 1, 2 and 3 and a stable patient, you can actually go for your non-operative management of the patient. Now, if there is no solid organ injury, you look for your free intra-abdominal fluid. If there is no free intra-abdominal fluid, you will go for a conservative treatment. Now, if there is a free intra-abdominal fluid, you will check if there is large amount of fluid, a seat bell sign. A tender abdomen and an abnormal vitals in that case you might again require a laparotomy if no then you can actually serially examine the patient and take your further decision as per your next observation of the patient so this would be your management protocol in case of a blunt trauma abdomen you can close your eyes and apply this basic logic to almost all the organs and the specific gradings of grade 1 2 3 4 5 you need to memorize them for at least your kidney liver and spleen now when you talk about penetrating trauma if the patient is having shock peritonitis and evisceration 
there are no questions asked to shift the patient to operation theater if there are no such features you will do a local wound exploration now local wound exploration if negative you may actually discharge the patient now if positive you would need to admit for observation now if there is instability then yes you would go for laparotomy now if there is no instability the significant decrease in human uh, hemoglobin or leukocytosis then again you would be requiring either to do a diagnostic peritoneal lavage or a laparotomy or a ct scan now if there is no significant decrease in hemoglobin or leukocytosis you can actually initiate the diet and discharge home so these are your basics of your abdominal trauma regarding your blunt and penetrating so please remember this flow chart and there should be and you should be able to solve most of the questions arising from your abdominal trauma i again repeat please remember the grading of your liver spleen kidney for sure now another important concept in your trauma section is regarding your maxillary fracture so we have this classification name called leaf fort classification so this is itself an important one liner question leaf or classification is used for maxilla now if you look over here you have your leaf or one right so in leaf or one you have your horizontal maxillary fracture separating teeth from upper face now the fracture line passes through the alveolar ridge lateral nose inferior wall of maxillary sinus now if you look at the leaf or two now this is your pyramidal fracture teeth at the pyramid base this is your pyramid base and the nasofrontal suture at the apex so this is your nasofrontal suture at the apex right so the fracture arc passes through the posterior alveolar ridge lateral walls of maxillary sinus inferior orbital rim and nasal bones and the type 3 is your craniofacial disjunction so over here what happens is that the transverse fracture line passes through the nasofrontal suture maxillofrontal suture orbital wall zygomatic arch and the zygomatic frontal suture right so please remember this leafot classification for the maxillary fractures you can actually be just placed a particular diagram for instance see this leafot and they can ask you what is the type of the leaf or they can give you a match the following by giving you three images and type one type two type three and you need to identify and match the column for your leaf or classification of maxillary fracture now regarding your mandible so you need to remember that the neck of condyle so right this neck one neck of condyle is the most common site of fracture so this is your question which is usually asked most common site of fracture in mandible that is your neck of condyle now again urethral trauma is a five star topic question again be it any exam it was asked in your last fmg last aims last neat pg so again you can anticipate and suspect a question to be coming from urethral trauma and again we will just follow one particular chart and some few basic differentiating points between your membranes and bulbar urethra which shall help us to solve the question so if you have a suspected urethral trauma you will go for an imaging right which be it form of endoscopic or urethrography if there is no injury it is a separate entity now if there is an injury you will check if it is an anterior urethra or a posterior urethra now you would go for draining the bladder which is by a suprapubic catheter and your urethral catheter followed by conservative management and reevaluate with imaging 6 to 12 weeks now if there is stricture you would again require a surgery if no stricture just follow up the patient now how will you know whether it is a bulbar urethra or a membranous urethra so in case of bulbar urethra it is a fall astride injury and a blow to perineum whereas in case of membranous urethra it is a fracture pelvis and a prolonged labor so this could two uh, points could actually be your clinical clue to uh, having a diagnosis of your bulbar to membranous urethra now in case of bulbar urethra you have retention of urine blood in external meters and perineal hematoma now in case of membranous you have extravasion of urine, urine into the pelvis and floating prostate so these are your two important points which is going to help you differentiate your bulbar and membranous urethra
right now regarding your retroperitoneal hemorrhage so which would be my last topic of discussion in your trauma section we have three zone so you have this first zone zone one now zone one is your major vessels right so if there is any injury in your zone one what you are going to do you are going to go for an operative repair now in case of zone 2 what it usually involves the kidney so when what are you going to do as a management plan in case of zone 2 injury so it is usually conservative now it will require surgery when when it is an expanding hematoma and second you would uh, be requiring to do surgery if there is continued blood loss now you have your zone 3 now what is zone 3 it is usually your pelvis now the cause of bleeding over here is usually an exanguating hemorrhage so it will usually require a conservative treatment right so this were your few important points with uh, respect to your abdominal trauma so we'll actually end with this discussion on damage control surgery so you have first thing to understand that is your lethal trial it includes your acidosis hypothermia and dilutional coagulopathy right now what is the concept of dcs it is your it is to blunt the physiologic response to prolonged shock and massive hemorrhage right now when will you do a dcs so the criteria for dcs includes hypothermia that is 34 degrees celsius acidosis ph less than 7.2 serum lactate that is more than 5 millimole per liter coagulopathy blood pressure less than 70 mm of hg transfusion approaching more than 15 units and injury severity score of more than 36 so this are your few important indications of your damage control surgery right so you need to understand the lethal thread and the criteria now what are the stages of your damage control surgery so the first one would be patient selection from this criteria now once you have selected the patient operative control of hemorrhage and contamination so you do the least that is required for the patient you are not going to try to attempt any vascular anastomosis no you are just going to go stop the bleeding place mop and come third step would be icu resuscitation now you are going to resuscitate the well and monitor the patient well in your icu setup followed by which you will go for a definitive surgery and then your abdominal closure right so these are your important stages of your damage control surgery right so this is a very evaluating concept in coming up in your trauma centers tertiary care level trauma centers so please make sure that you revise this concept of damage control surgery so this were your important points with respect to your trauma now trauma itself is an mc mch speciality so definitely it's a never-ending topic but then this were your few important subtopics of the trauma which i think should help you in order to solve all the questions if not all the majority of the questions that can be asked from the trauma section right so now we move down to the next section so our next section would be on the pediatric surgery now in pediatric surgery what i have done is i have taken some important uh, topics which are pediatric diseases and have been frequently asked it is not possible to discuss the entire pediatric surgery in this particular uh, video of your mega revision class but i have chosen some of the most important topics from your pediatric surgery chapter so first we have your infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis now this is a non bilious projectile vomiting the first mcq itself is in this line it is a non bilious vomiting if you're talking about bilious vomiting you can actually easily rule out infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis time of presentation is two to six weeks now it is different from the infective causes because of the postprandial hunger 
Now, once vomiting starts, its frequency and forcefulness increases daily. Now, it is a differential diagnosis from your gastroesophageal reflux disease in the newborn, which usually waxes and wanes. So now, if you are being given a clinical scenario, a patient presenting with a non-bilious vomiting and the frequency and forcefulness is increasing daily then yes, it is infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Whereas, if it is waxing and waning, you would actually be thinking of gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now, incidence is around 1 in 300, having a more of male preponderance. And the test feed, that is gastric peristalsis, left to right, feeding baby relaxed, you might find a olive mass in your right upper quadrant. Now, the star MCQ point of infantile hypertrophic Pyloric stenosis or rather I can say it in any case of gastric outlet obstruction, the metabolic abnormality, hypokalemic, hypochloromic, metabolic alkalosis, right? Now you also need to remember when you talk about geo and occurring cases of gastric cancer, you have the same hypokalemic, hyponatremic, hypochloromic, metabolic alkalosis with paradoxical acid urea right so please do remember now how do you correct it 0.9 percent saline with 0.5 percent casein and 5 percent glucose at 6 to 7.5 milligram per kg per hour now the treatment would be the operative procedure tramstead pyloromyotomy right so this were your few important points for your infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis now the next disease that I have is your tracheoesophageal fistula. So the postnatal presentation is usually in form of your drooling, aspiration, sinusis, and feeding. Now, what are your various types? So questions have been asked from the various types. So type A, if you look over here, is an esophageal atresia. Now type B is your proximal T fistula with an esophageal atresia. Now type C is your tra distal tracheoesophageal fistula with an esophageal atresia. Now type 4 is your proximal plus distal and type 5 is your pure TE that is pure tracheoesophageal fistula without any esophageal atresia and it is also known as type H. Now, an important MCQ that is usually framed from here is regarding your vacuole anomalies. So, the vacuole anomalies that are associated include your vertebral anomalies, anorectal malformation, cardiac, tracheoesophageal fistula, renal abnormalities, and limb abnormalities. Right. So, these are your few important points with respect to your tracheoesophageal fistula that I would want you all to remember. Now, when we are talking about vacuole anomalies, there have there is a new table or a chart that has been added in your BAD and love regarding your syndromic association. So, an exhaustive table which I believe must have been covered in your pediatric section. Hence, I am not included. Now, in case it has not been covered in your pediatrics, make sure that you take a look at that table from your Bailey and Love and I shall be sharing it in your Game PG YouTube channel soon so that in case if it is not you not miss that particular video when it's been shared now coming back to the discussion so now we go down to the next important disease which is your Hirschsprung disease now this is also known as your congenital megacolon now what happens over here absence of a ganglionic ga absence of sorry not a ganglionic ganglionic cells that is Meissner's and Auerbach uh, or back plexus which results to a ganglionosis as a result of which bowel fail to relax and there is a functional obstruction you need to remember that this Hirschsprung disease always involves your anus internal sphincter and rectum so which of the following is not involved if you have this three remember whatever is your fourth option is going to be the answer now Anis to sigmoid colon is seen in 75% cases, to proximal colon is seen in 15% and terminal ileum is seen in around 10%. Now your genetic defects includes your RET, EDNRB and EDN3. Now the clinical features include your delayed pass passage of meconium, abdominal distension and bilious vomiting. Now the diagnosis is by your rectal biopsy. And you have your acetylcholine esterase staining and the calretinin immunostaining which is useful in the diagnosis of your Hirschberg disease. So these three are actually the most important pediatric surgery disorders which you need to remember for your exam. And definitely there are more which we will be discussing subsequently but you cannot tend to miss on those three. 
right so this is uh, your barium sorry yeah barium enema image showing which is your proximal dilated colon over here and this is your narrow pathological colon and this is your transition zone right and your treatment would be you need to remember the names modified to hamel so swenson procedures right so please do remember this particular names and if you ask the most common the most common would be your laparoscopy assisted so procedure so what is modified to hamel so over here what happens is that a ganglionic rectal stump is left in place and ganglionated normal colon pulled behind the stump and a colo anal anastomosis is done now in case of so what happens is that endorectal mucosal dissection with a ganglionic distal rectum and the ganglionic normal colon pulled through remnant muscle cuff and a colo anal anastomosis is done in case of Swenson, a ganglionic ball removed to the level of internal sphincter and a coloanal anastomosis is done. So these are your three important procedures which you do for your Hirschsprung disease, right? So if you need to remember the most common procedure is your laparoscopic assisted SOFS procedure. Now, with respect to your intestinal atresia, I would ask you to remember if you see a double bubble sign, that is your duodenal atresia, right? So obstruction lies distal to the ampulla of waiter. Now, the proximal duodenum and the pylorus dilate with the swallowed. What is the content which is causing this dilation? It is the amniotic fluid, amniotic fluid, and the pylorus is ten. Uh, because of this accumulation, is becoming incompetent now the web may stretch like a wind stalk and your x-ray is going to show you a double bubble sign as i had mentioned and the vomiting over here will be your bilious vomiting please remember non-bilious is infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis and your treatment would be your kimura stomy. Now, in your intestinal uh, atresia, you have this particular types of jejunal atresia where you have your type 1, which is your mucosal web or diaphragm. Type 2 is an atretic cord. So, if you look over here, this is your atretic cord over here. Right. Then you have your type 3, which is your complete separation by a V gap. Right. And then type 3 B, which looks like core of the apple. And type 4 is your multiple atresia with your string of sausage appearance now the questions that have been framed over here most commonly is type 3b which is apple peel or christmas tree deformity right and string of sausage appearance in type 4 now regarding some unital abdominal wall conditions so first we have your omphalocele now omphalocele it is a central defect it has an intact membranous sac by pore, right, which is peritoneum, amniotic membrane, water and jelly. Right, so it is covered by, remember the cat paws, that is your peritoneum, amniotic membrane and your water and jelly. Now this is associated with your syndrome, beckwith Weidman syndrome. Now what are the components of your beckwith Weidman syndrome? Gigantism, macroglossia, umbilical defect, hernia or omphalocele. Now please remember it is macroglossia and gigantism most commonly you confuse with microglossia no it is macroglossia now another important is your pentology of cantrell so which of the followings are components of pentology of cantrell you have omphalocele anterior diaphragmatic hernia so this is your most confusion op uh, confusing option that is given they usually give in your option as posterior diaphragmatic hernia so you have to remember it is anterior diaphragmatic hernia sternal cleft ectopia cardia and intracardiac defect like vsd so these are your components of your pentology of cantrell. Now, example is minor are those which are less than 5 cm, liver not involved and major is more than 5 cm and liver involved. So the treatment would be preservation of intact sac with sterile maintaining gauge, IV fluids, antibiotics, gastric decompression, prevent hypothermia. And for your exemphilis major, you would be requiring brassic with topical antibacterial agent which allows the epithelization and the later closure. Now, if early closure done in case of E major, what is going to happen? You need to monitor the patient for your abdominal compartment syndrome as you're going to make the patient at increased risk for it. 
right so this were your few important points regarding your omphalocele now with omphalocele comes your gastrous kisses right so these are your two most important confusion uh, which arises so you need to remember omphalocele is your central wall defect now this is defect to the right side of the umbilical cord and right up at the site of the obliterated right umbilical vein now there is absence of sac now in case of omphalocele, uh, omphalocele there were three coverings also remember peritoneum amniotic uh, amniotic uh, amnion and Wharton's jelly. Now, the absence of sac is going to cause your direct exposure of intestine to the amniotic fluid in utero, as a result of which intestine is thickened, edematous, and foreshortened. Now, the associated anomalies are usually rare, but if associated, it is associated in 15 percent with intestinal atresia, right? And the risk factors include your young maternal age and your drug use. So the most important uh, framing of question from this is you to diagnose whether it is a gastrocystis or an umphalocele. The, uh, the clue in the question would be given the right of the umbilical defect or from the central side of the abdominal wall. So that is how you are going to decide whether it is umphalocele or gastrocystis. So this were your few important uh, pediatric surgical conditions which I wanted to discuss. Now let's move on to the next section which is regarding your plastic surgery. Right. So plastic surgery along with plastic surgery I'll be discussing the burns. Now in burn you need to remember that the basic management would again follow the ATLS guideline. So we just read about the ATLS guidelines. ATLS guidelines would be your CABCT. Now in that with specific to burn you would need to know where your airway dangers are there. For example if there is inhalation or smoke burns and accordingly you need to modify your treatment over there and if for example if whether there is edema edematous larynx or not so on the basis of that you need to manage regarding your a b c d e now i'll be just focusing on some important aspects and the newly added concepts in your bailey and love so this is your protocol for assessing the depth of burn which has been recently added in your bailey and love so if you look at the burn is their epidermal integrity now this is your Nikolsky sky now if the epidermal integrity is present it is an epidermal burn right now if there is no epidermal integrity then you run a glove finger over the burn you check is it slippery now if it is not slippery then you look at the burn color now if the burn color is red then it is deep dermal Right. Now, what are the signs of deep dermal? So, you have decreased sensation, absent or reduced refilling after blanching, fixed mottling, or little or no ooze. Now, if the burn color is white, that is a full thickness, that is other signs anesthesia. Or other signs include your anesthesia, no refilling after blanching, maybe amber or translucent with visible black vessels, maybe waxy, hair falls, falls out easily or dry. Now, if when you rub, it is uh, when you run your glove finger over the burn area and it is slippery then you check the type of blister now if this blister is thin walled or popped then it is a superficial dermal which is blanching with pressure very painful and very oozy now if the type of blister is actually thick walled then it is mid dermal which includes some mottling blanching sluggish darker red base and some anesthesia and less oozy so with this concept i think it is easier to remember the classification of burns like epidermal superficial dermal mid dermal deep dermal and full thickness and if we try to follow this in our clinical based scenarios we shall be able to answer most of the questions also from the burn now apart from this there is some one another concept which is mentioned in your sabison textbook which is your jackson area which includes three zones of burn that is your zone of coagulation zone of stasis and zone of hyperemia so please remember this three important zone as per the jackson area now this is the examiner's favorite question rule of nine but what you need to remember is that this is not an accurate or an uh, accurate measurement this is just an emergency estimate right 
the standard formatting is actually by your modified london browser chart so if you look over here what i would want you to, uh, you all to remember is that external genitalia is one person and rest i'm pretty sure you guys are know the lower limbs being your 18 percent upper limbs being your nine percent upper limbs like four and a half in the front side four and a half in the back side lower limb 18 percent nine percent on the front side and nine percent on the back side head and neck is again your four and a half person in the front side four and a half person in the back side and you have your chest and abdomen nine percent each on the back side and nine percent each on the front side right now the standard formatting is as per your learned and browder chart so if you look over here this is showing your age in years and your adults so if you look over here head is around nine whereas in adults it is around three thigh two four leg is two and in adults it is three so you can see the head the amount of area involved by head is actually decreasing and the amount of area involved by thigh and leg is actually increasing as we reach by the adult size now the another important and the frequently asked question from your burn section is regarding your fluid resuscitation now the most commonly used crystalloid is your ringer lactate or the hartman solution now it is as per the modified parklet formula which is total burn area into weight into 4 into volume in ml now again this is a controversial thing as your atls 10th edition guidelines have given to however the recent questions that have been free from exam everybody has stuck down to the 4 so hence i am actually mentioning it 4 but as per the atls 10th guideline it is tbsa into weight into 2 now how it is done first half in 8 hours and the second half is usually given in your 16 hours now apart from the crystalloid colloids may be given and it is usually given after first 12 hours now which is the most commonly colloid use it is albumin now what is the formula that is your muir barclay formula which is given by total body surface area into weight into 0.5 and it is usually your one portion and six portions six such portions are actually given over 36 hours right not six hours it is six portions are usually given over your 36 hours so this is with respect to your fluid resuscitation now in burn you always need to take care nutrition if possible and the patient can tolerate enteral nutrition is definitely the best and now another important question which is asked is regarding your escherotomy right so in upper limb it is mid axial anterior to elbow medially to avoid in the ulnar nerve hand it is midline in the digits and release the muscle compartments if tied and best done in the theater now in case of lower limb it is again mid axial posterior to the ankle medially to avoid the long saphenous vein and anterior to head of the fibula to avoid the common peroneal nerve then you have your chest where it is down the chest lateral to the nipples across the chest below the clavicle and across the chest at the level of the feet sternum now you have the general rules which extend the wound beyond the deep burn diathermy any significant bleeding vessels and apply hemostatic dressing and elevate the limb post operatively so these are your few key features of the escherotomy patient right now coming down to the plastic surgery proper i would want to discuss a few points regarding the grafts and the flap so regarding graft so it is transferred without their blood supply now split thickness graph it includes epidermis and variable amount of dermis right so this is also known as your thirsch graft right so this itself is the important mcq that has been asked now it is simple to harvest and large areas of skin to reconstruct sizable defect following your significant burn injury right so they can actually trick you by giving you a question that a patient was admitted to your burn unit where you are doing x y z now which of the following is used to reconstruct the patient a simple thickness graft b full thickness graft now when such a clinical scenario is given to you you would actually tend to apply your brain and mark wrong answers but please remember now significant burn injury we use theos graft now full thickness is your epidermis plus dermis now as it contains dermis it retains your elasticity right and they are less prone to your secondary contracture now 
the wolf face it is also known as your wolf face graph and the harvest site includes your supraclavicular region groin crease and your post auricular region and it's used it for the syndactyly release contracture release and reconstruction of the facial defect now the composite skin graft are your skin plus any another tissue like your fat or cartilage like helical root of ear to construct the alar nose is one such example of your composite skin graft now the stages of skin graft include your imbibition inosculation and neovascularization now this inosculation is including your capillary ingrowth and fibroblast maturation right so this were your few important points with respect to your skin graft now regarding your flap so this are again all your image based questions because the pro, the chances of questions coming from fl flaps but actually also be your image based so if you look at this this is an example of your transposition flap where there is a defect and according to the uh, pivot point it is transposed and covered so a donor defect is usually grafted or it can be closed primarily now if you look over here this are your two triangular trans uh, position flaps interposed so this is your z plasty then you have your bilo flap which is used to close a convex defect that is in the nose usually then you have a bipedical flap which is used to rebuild the lower eyelid then you have a rhomboid flap or a parallelogram shaped transposition flap right then you have a rotation flap if you look at this image this is an example of a rotation flap now then we have your advancement flap so in advancement flap what you need to know is that the two burrows triangles that are present which can be excised at the end uh, at the base of the flap to make it slide now this is an example of a v to y flap which is used in a cut finger tip right and then you have your y to v which is used multiple uh, band to release uh, scars over the joints right and uh, so this were your few examples now over here what i would actually ask you all to remember is definitely a bilo flap which is has been asked and has the chances of to be asked again and the bipedical flap and this uh, flaps like transposition flaps the rotational flaps and the rhomboid flaps are going to come in your uh, various uh, surgical techniques that we might discuss uh, that we shall be discussing uh, ahead like for example one of them would be the limburg flap that we use in your pilonidal sinus right now there has been two recent classification which has been added in your plastic surgery section which is your fasciocutaneous flap and the muscle flap now the fasciocutaneous flap classification is by your cormac and lamberti classification i'll write it down again for you guys cormac and lamberti classification right so if you look over here this are your examples of your various classes so if you look over here class a where you have your multiple large uh, perforators the example is a pontine flap then if you look at the example b that is a single large perforator so this is a scapular or a parascapular flap and then if you see at the example c which is your small and segmental perforators it is seen in your radial forearm and a free fibular flap is your osteomyofascial perforators now the classification for the muscle flap is by your mathis nahe classification now if you look at this particular example now type 1 is your single vascular pedicle and the example is your tensor fascia lata type 2 is your one dominant with one or more minor pedicles that is your gracilis type 3 is your dual dominant that is your gluteus maximus and even pectoralis major sartorius is your type 4 where you have your segmental pedicles and then you have your dominant with several small or segment pedal pedicles which is your latimus dorsi so in order in, again revising this uh, mathis nahe classification type 1 is your tensor fascia lata type 2 is your gracilis type 3 is your gluteus maximus type 4 is your sartorius and type 5 is your latimus dorsi right so please uh, do remember this particular 
flaps at least remember this five examples and there are other examples also but at your level i think remembering this particular five uh, five examples tensor fascia lateral as type one gluteus maximus as type three right bracelet is as type two latimus dorsi as type five and your sartorius as type four would be sufficient for your exam right so this were your important points which i wanted you all to know in the section of plastic surgery now moving down to the next is your neurosurgery so in neurosurgery we would be basically focusing on your neurotrauma right because that is a point from where your questions have been maximum maximally framed in your fmg exam so let's begin with the basics of neurotrauma so you have your normal cerebral blood flow which is your 55 ml per minute per 100 gram of brain tissue now ischemia occurs when this blood flow falls to a level below 20 ml now this flow depends upon your cerebral perfusion pressure which is ranging from 75 to 105 mm hg now the difference between now the cpp is calculated as cpp is the difference between your mean arterial pressure minus your intracranial pressure now this mean arterial pressure is in the range 90 to 110 mm of hg and intracranial pressure is 5 to 15 mm of hg now the cerebral autoregulation is a constant cerebral blood flow across the range of map 50 to 150 mm of hg now you need to understand one important principle as this is a direct principle that is asked by the name monroe kelly doctrine so what it says is that the cranium is a rigid box now in this rigid box you have a brain which is nearly incomprehensible now so there is if there is any expansion in the contents be it a hematoma or a brain swelling it is accommodated by the exclusion of the fluid component which is either the venous blood or the csf now as a result of which if there is a further rise in icp there is going to be an exponential rise and as a result of which it is going to give away and cause a cerebral herniation so this is your monroe kelly doctrine now in your cerebral herniation you need to remember that uncle herniation is going to cause pupillary abnormalities so if you look over here now this number one is your subfalcine herniation then two is your midline shift then three over here is an uncle herniation which is causing your pupillary abnormalities then you have your four now this is your actually a central herniation and five is your tonsillar herniation through the foramen magnum now this compresses the vasomotor respiratory center as a result of which there is hypertension bradycardia and irregular respiration so cushing tried itself is a five star mcq question now glasgow coma scale so i believe there is no exam again which does not ask a question on this you need to remember this glasgow coma scale three components i work eye response verbal response motor response best response is your motor response and you always take the best response in each of the response so in eye response spontaneous to speech to pain none so that is your score of four three two one and non-testable is a recently uh, added score in as per your atls 10th edition now verbal response if it is oriented the score is five confused four words three sounds two and if there is no response one and non-testable nt now in case of uh, best motor response you have obese command localizing five normal flexion abnormal flexion three extension two none one now what is the most common source of confusion over here now see if the uh, patient has come from or uh, is in your uh, emergency department with a road traffic accident and has a right hand localizing to pain and the left hand showing normal flexion what will be your m score over here so please remember it is the best re uh, motor response so you will obviously take the localizing one that is a score of five now there has been a recent addition of a gcs minus p score now what is this p p is the pupillary assessment where you have zero that is your no abnormality one is your unilateral two is your 
bile anchor so this gcs minus p score and you need to remember this that minimum score possible is 3 you cannot have a patient with a gcs of 0 1 or 2 right minimum is 3 it can be 1 1 1 and the maximum score that is possible is your 15 right yeah so it is 4 maximum 5 6 so it is 6 4 10 15 right now the pediatric glasgow coma scale score now this has been recently added in a bailey and love so till now most of the questions that were being framed were being framed from an adult based scenario so now there are potential or actually chances for you to be asked questions from this pediatric glasgow coma scale score which is eye opening which is essentially the same as the adults the motor response is again essentially the same as the other. Now the major change is actually occurring at verbal response because the baby is not going to speak or talk as the other. So if it, the baby coos or babbles it is 5, irritably cries 4, cries in response to pain is 3, moans in response to pain is 2 and no response is 1. So these are some of your important points with respect to your Glasgow Coma Scale score. Right. Now coming down to some other classification, the severity of head injury classification, uh, head injury with the clinical classification, minor is GCS 15 with no loss of consciousness, mild is 14 to 15 with loss of consciousness, moderate is 9 to 13 with loss of consciousness and severe is GCS 3 to 8 with loss of consciousness or there might not be any loss of consciousness. Now. Again, an important table or chart from your Bailey and Love, which is a potential MCQ. What are your indications of CT scan within one hour? So if it is GCS less than 13 at any point, GCS less than 15 at two hours, any focal neurological deficit, suspected open depressed or basal skull fracture, more than one episode of vomiting and post-traumatic seizure. So if there are this following features, then you need to go for a CT scan. Now, the indication of CT imaging within 8 hours, if the age is more than 65 years, coagulopathy, dangerous mechanism of injury and retrograde amnesia for more than 30 minutes. So these are your indications of CT imaging within 8 hours. Now, we talk about the skull base fracture because these are again your FMG favorite topics. So bleeding of CSF leak from ears that is otorrhea or from the nose which is your rhinorrhea now the bruising behind ears is your battle sign so please remember this image as this has been previously asked in your fmg exam then bruising around the eyes is known as your panda sign now they usually resolve spontaneously in case of persistent leak meningitis there the risk increases right and as a result of which they require repair now the CSF leak, you need to remember one important diagnosis which is your beta 2 transferrin, right? So beta 2 transferrin has to be, remember it is an important, one of the important diagnostic tests in case of your skull base fractures. Now the insertion of the blind nasogastric tube is insertion is contraindicated in case of your skull base fracture. So these are your few important points with uh, respect to your skull base fractures. Now coming down to the extradural hematoma. Now this is a linear skull fracture. There is usually tear of dural vessels. Now there is an arterial bleed. The most common location being an anterior branch of your middle meningeal artery. Now if you look at the CT scan, there is a biconvex collection of the blood. Right. What is the most common location? It is your temporoparietal. Now conservative treatment can be done in case of extradural hematoma if the blood Volume is less than 30 ml, less than 5 ml thick clot, less than 5 ml midline shape, and GCS more than 8 without any deficits. Now, friends, for FMG, extradural hematoma versus subdural hematoma is a favorite topic. Almost last four sessions have been having questions directly on it. So do not miss this CT image. It is a very high scoring question, and you should not be making a mistake in it. Right. Now, the clinical features include your contralateral hemiparesis and ipsilateral pupillary dilation and you need to do a surgery which would be a craniotomy. Now, in case of your subdural hematoma, now you need to know that there are three types of subdural hematoma. One is acute, second is subacute, third is chronic. Acute is within three days, subacute is four to 21 days and chronic is more than 21 days. Now, this is also known as pachymeningitis hemorrhagica interna. Now, if you look over here, this is your acute subdural hemorrhage 
and this is showing your chronic subdural hematoma now they tend to cross the suture line tear or bridging vessels and they're over the cerebral convexity now ct scan as shown over here are crescent or concave or convex now for the treatment if it is acute trauma you do a surgical evacuation you know if it is trauma in case and if it is acute and because of old age then you would go for a conservative treatment now in case of chronic if it is a small bleed and asymptomatic go for a conservative treatment else you need to go for a burr hole drainage so this is going to be your treatment for your subdural hematoma so friend base of skull fracture edh and sdh these are three important points which you cannot miss to revise for your fmg exam now the various key parameters that are maintained in your head injury patients in your neurointensive care includes your paco2 4.5 to 5 kilopascals po2 11 kilopas more than 11 kilopascals map that is 80 to 90 mm of hg icp that is less than 20 mm of hg cpp that is more than 60 mm of hg sodium more than 140 and potassium more than 4 milli mole per liter so these are your few important key parameters in your head injured patient now regarding your glasgow outcome scale so again five denotes for good recovery four denotes for moderate disabilities three for severe disability two for persistent vegetative state and one is for day so they can directly ask you a question glasgow coma scale 2 is applied for persistent vegetative state Right. So, this were your few important points with respect to your neurosurgery. Now, neurosurgery itself is a vast topic where you have a lot of questions even relating to your tumors or hydrocephalus. But for this session, I am actually focusing mainly on the neurotrauma in addition to one more topic which is your subacnoid hemorrhage. So, first question that you need to remember is that most common cause is your trauma. And the most common cause of spontaneous SAH is because of your aneurysmal rupture. And the most common location of aneurysm is your circle of villus. Now, how does it present? Now, you will have a classical clue in your clinical question. Thunderclap headache or the worst headache of his life. That is actually what we are hinting towards a subacnoid hemorrhage. Now imaging of first choice is your CT scan. So if you look over here, this is your diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage. Right. Now there's some gradings and scores with uh, your SAI. So they have not been mentioned in your Bailey and Love, but then it is very important as your examiners have tendency to ask this SAI when it comes down to neurosurgery. So worst is your World Federation Neurological Society grading. Grade 1 is your GCS 15 with no focal deficits. Grade 2 is your GCS of 13 to 14 without any focal deficit. GCS uh, 13 to 14 is your grade 3 with your focal deficits now gc 7 to 12 is your grade 4 F focal deficits may or may not be present and 3 to 9 is your grade 5 now another important is grading is your hunt and his clinical grading so you have your asymptomatic or minimal headache or slight nuchal rigidity which is your grade 1 having a good outcome approximately 70 percent recovers then you have your moderate to severe headache or nuchal rigidity plus minus cranial nerve palsy now again that is a good outcome so grade 1 and grade 2 are associated with your good outcome that is almost around 70 percent then you have your drowsy confusion or mild focal deficit which is your grade 3 again this has a poor outcome which is around approximately 15 percent then you have your stupor moderate to severe hemiparesis and possible early decerebrate rigidity which is grade 4 this is again having a poor uh, outcome only because it's only a good outcome in around 15 percent and then your grade 5 is your deep coma decerebrate rigidity and moribund appearance which is having a good outcome in approximately only zero percent that is uh, essentially it is fatal to life now the last important chart which i would want you all to remember for sh is your fissure grading so if you look over here grade one is your no hemorrhage evident grade two is your diffuse sh with vertical layers which are less than one mm thick Grade 3 is your localized clots and or vertical layers of SH which are more than 1 mm thick. And grade 4 is a diffuse or no SH but the intracerebral or intraventricular hemorrhage. Right. So, these are your important 
points which you need to remember for your SH. Now, apart from that, surgical management would be your craniotomy and clipping and endovascular embolization with coiling and medical management includes your nemo dipping. Right. So these are your few important points with neurosurgery. Now in neurosurgery, I've actually focused mainly on your neurotrauma. Apart from that, again, the pediatric neurosurgical conditions like myelingomeningocele, meningocele have not been asked, but then they may be asked. So we shall again discuss this in our telegram group if required. But for this class, we shall limit our discussion in neurosurgery to neurotrauma because this is one point where I do not want you all to make any mistake. Right. So please make sure that you revise this neurotrauma section very well. Now we move down to the next section, which is your endocrine. Right. Now endocrine itself is again a huge topic because you know endocrine itself is an MCH subject. Now in endocrine you have again a separate uh, branch uh, breast. Now in breast itself you have a different degree of MCH breast. So now we, what we are going to do is in that in case of endocrine we are going to discuss some important points of thyroid breast, parathyroid, adrenal. Right. So discussion of entire topics in detail is beyond the scope. For that you can actually visit to our GamePG app uh, and watch the videos. But right now for the exam purpose, I would want you all to focus on this particular section of endocrine where I'll be just trying to focus on the most important and the frequently asked and the recent new additions in Bailey and Love. Right. So if you find that he yes, anything is being me missed or you want me to discuss it separately. So feel free to uh, put down in your comment sections or drop us a mail at your game PG app at the rate of gmail.com or you can use my email ID, which I'll share at the end of the session and we'll definitely make sure that we'll discuss those sessions. Right. So if you have any doubts as of now, before we move down to the discussion of endocrine, do let know else we'll continue with the endocrine surgery right okay so we'll continue with our discussion on the endocrine so first in endocrine i'll be discussing regarding your thyroid right so in thyroid what i'll do is i'll discuss an approach to the thyroid nodule which should be able to solve most of the mcqs that are going to ask in your exam so first approach to thyroid nodule, when a patient comes with you to a thyroid nodule, you will go for a history and a clinical examination. Your history, you would include your onset of progression, compression of neck structures, hypo, features of hyper or hypothyroidism, eye symptoms and treatment received, family history and community history. Now in case of clinical examination, you would examine the thyroid swelling, compression and any features of thyrotoxicosis. Now following that you would go for your first investigation which is your serum TSH. Now if this serum TSH is low then you will go for a radio isotope scan. Now in radio isotope scan if it is an overactive nodule that is an hot nodule you will go for an iodine 131 or surgery. Now in case of a cold nodule when there is no isotope uptake you would need to go for an ultrasound. Now, also if the serum TSH was high normal, you would require an ultrasound. Now in this ultrasound would be a high resolution ultrasound with the feature of with the frequency of 7 to 13 megahertz. Now what are the features that you're going to check in this ultrasound? Margins, ill-defined, irregular shape, hypoechoic, microcalcification hypervascular elastography lymph node architecture architectural distortion now in the lymph node you are going to check for loss of fatty hilum, transverse diameter more than 7 mm heterogeneity or microcalcification. now on the basis of this you are going to classify it into high intermediate category low very low benign now if it is benign no fine needle aspiration is required if it is very low, then fine needle aspiration cytology would be required if it is more than 2 cm in size. Now, if it is low, then if the size is more than 1.5 cm, then you would be requiring a fine needle aspiration cytology. Now, similarly for high intermediate, you would require FNA if it is more than 1 cm. Now, let's again actually look at the diagrammatic uh, representation of this high intermediate low very low benign before we come to it so if you look over here now this is your high suspicion so if you look at this diagram over here 
you have micro calcification hypoequic irregular margins hypoic taller than wide hypoic irregular margins with extra thyroid extensions again hypoic interrupted rim calcification and you have nodule with irregular margin suspicious left lateral lymph node now immediate intermediate suspicion that is around 10 to 20 percent you have hypoic solid regular margin and hypoic quick solid regular margins right in case of low suspicions you have hypoic uh, hyper equate right so over here it is a hyper equate please remember hyper equate solid regular margin iso equate solid regular margin partially cystic with eccentric solid area right and then you have your very low suspicion which is spongy form partially cystic suspicious features and benign which is like a cyst so on the basis of this you actually classify if it is a high risk more than one centimeter and in case of a very low risk you would actually do it after a two centimeter and a low risk you would do with more than 1.5 centimeter and if it is benign you actually need not do a final aspiration cytology now what is the classification of the final aspiration cytology report so we'll be reading two classifications one is your thigh classification and second is your bethesda classification so thigh one now the questions have been framed actually directly from here Thigh 1 is non-diagnostic, 1C is non-diagnostic cystic, Thigh 2 is non-neoplastic, Thigh 3 is follicular, Thigh 4 is suspicious of malignancy, Thigh 5 is malignant. Now the Bethesda classification would be non-diagnostic class 1, 2 is benign, 3 is atypia, 4 is follicular neoplasm, 5 is suspicious of malignancy and 6 is malignant. Right. So please remember this uh, classifications as there have been questions which are actually directly asked from this. Like for example, what is thigh 1C denoting? A follicular is thigh 3 and 4 in case of Bethesda classification. So this is also one important MCQ confusion that we often tend to make a mistake. Thigh 3 is follicular and Bethesda class 4 is follicular neoplasm. Now these are your HP images showing your category 2, category 3, category 4, 5 and 6. Right. So this must have been dealt in your pathology session. So I am like uh, skipping on it and moving down to the next section. So now in another important question that are framed from your thyroid section apart from what I showed you the approach of the nodule is regarding your cancel. So they will usually form a MCQ based or uh, MCQ based on your clinical scenario giving the important features of the various types of cancer. So you need to do the diagnosis or they might actually ask you a direct based question like in papillary uh, can cancer what is your uh, like uh, or finally, I look like or some of my bodies are seen in papillary thyroid cancer. So let's look at the important features. Papillary carcinoma, it is the most common female. It is more common in female. Peak incidence in third to fifth decade. Propensity for the lymph node. Distant metastasis is uncommon. It is a high risk uh, of your occult metastasis. Papillary microcarcinoma is when it is said to be less than one centimeter. It has an excellent prognosis and complex branching papillae with pseudonucleation, nuclear grooving and some more bodies are seen. So this is your classical HP image of your papillary thyroid carcinoma and you can look over here at the orphan Annie eye nuclei. So generally this sort of HP image is given and asks you for the diagnosis. Now, regarding the follicular carcinoma, you, it is seen in elderly, differentiated only on histopathology. So, you cannot ever differentiate a follicular neoplasm on FNA. Please remember this point and this is one of the most important points which is also tweaked in your MCQs in order to test your basic knowledge. Right? Then it is shown uh, a follicular carcinoma has propensity to show bloodborne metastasis. It is usually seen in patients with history of long-standing goiter and a variant which is a hurtle cell variant which has a poor prognosis and oxenphilic cells. Now the next uh, form of uh, thyroid cancer is your anaplastic thyroid can cancer which is the de-differentiation of the papillary or poorly differentiated cancer, rapid growth, visceral invasion or distant meds. Now you have giant and multinucleate cells, sheet of cell marked with heterogeneity, limited role of radiotherapy and chemotherapy and tracheostomy may be required on the airway signs of obstruction. Now medullary uh, carcinoma from the parafollicular cells. Uh, now you have your characteristic amyloid stroma, calcitonin and C level may be elevated. Diarrhea is seen in your 30% that is 5-hydroxy uh, tryptamine is the main causative agent for this diarrhea. It may be familial in around 10 to 20%. 
it is associated with men syndrome lymph node is seen in around 50 to 60 percent and you have your treatment as total thyroidectomy with bilateral neck dissection that is your treatment for your medullary thyroid carcinoma right so i guess the speed is being very fast but then the main idea is to cover as much as possible topics in your this final short revision of your fmg class so please bear with the speed right so another important concept or the question that i asked is regarding your differentiated thyroid cancer right so after total thyroidectomy if it is a low risk then you would require a radio iodine uh, therapy may not be required actually now if it is a high risk then you usually require radio iodine therapy now the purpose of giving you this particular point is that this was actually asked in one of your last fmg sessions right so it's not that radio iodine therapy is mandatory for all the patients of the differentiated thyroid carcinoma no it is usually reserved for patients with high risk now you have your high risk scoring system and your low risk scoring uh, high risk scoring system now which would be basically showing an incomplete resection or having an extra thyroid extension right on hb they are much more aggressive cancer so this are your basically high risk cancer now coming down to the parathyroid so this was all about your thyroid definitely there are much more points in thyroid it's just not the end of the thyroid but then this were the few important points and the topics which have been asked uh, previously in your exams and the reason for putting them here so now again parathyroid again parathyroid will be doing the same thing that will be the plan for your entire endocrine where we'll be discussing only few important points because the detailed discussion videos will be available in your app now parathyroid now one important question which is frequently and invariably asked is regarding the development so the inferior parathyroid or the thymus develops from the third pharyngeal uh, pouch whereas superior develops from the fourth pharyngeal pouch now fourth pharyngeal, pharyngeal pouch so the examiners have even asked on which portion dorsal or ventral so guys please remember it is the dorsal portion of the fourth pharyngeal pouch now this is the action of the parathyroid hormone again a physiology question but then please remember this is very important over here uh, because the questions have been asked regarding this so parathyroid hormone causes calcium mobilization from the bones causing the increase in the plasma calcium concentration they also cause the renal tubular absorption of calcium which causes the activation of vitamin d and the calcium absorption in intestine as a result of which plasma calcium concentration increases what i need you all to focus and remember over here is that the action on intestine is actually an indirect action action on kidney and bone this two are your direct actions and your actions on your intestine is your indirect action another important point that i want to remember is that this pth acts on osteoblast as well as osteoclast please remember it is just not acting on osteoclast it is acting on osteoblast also right now it has an anabolic effect that is trabecular more than cortical bone and catabolic effect more on the cortical easy to remember c for catabolic c for cortical much more of cortical than the trabecular now the questions that are framed in your parathyroid are mainly towards the parathyroid localization so the most important that i want you all to remember is your sesati may be scan which is your most accurate and your reliable now other important diagnostic modalities what i would want you all to remember in case of usg is that it is hypoechoic and what is the definition of a giant parathyroid adenoma it is more than three centimeter now similarly for dct so what is the fun fourth component that has been added it is the functional component that has been added in case of parathyroid localization now and one important criteria which is your miami criteria now what happens in your miami criteria now there is drop in pth into the normal range and to less than half of the max pre op pth at 10 minutes right so this is about your miami criteria so this are your few very important points with respect to your parathyroid localization now coming down to the few important features of primary hyperparathyroidism now the presentation is now typically asymptomatic rather than the classical bone stones abdominal groans and psychiatric overtone so if you get this four 
bone stone grown over tone psychiatric it is actually dealing with the case of primary hyperparathyroidism diagnosis is actually a biochemical one now what you find a presence of elevated ionized calcium with an inappropriate elevated and not suppressed pth level confirms the diagnosis then you have your cesset mb and your focus neck ultrasonography which are your first line radiological investigations now 85 percent of cases are due to your single adenoma and your minimally invasive parathyroidotomy is a safe acceptable alternative to a four gland exploration in the presence of your localized disease and your familial syndrome and disease that is not localized require a formal four gland exploration and a three and a half gland parathyroidectomy right then you have your secondary hyperparathyroidism which is primarily due to the underlying chronic disease it is associated with your parathyroid hyperplasia diagnosis is made chemi biochemically with a low or no calcium and an elevated pth you have your high phosphate levels and low vitamin d levels are seen so guys you need to remember this differentiation between your primary secondary and tertiary hyperparathyroidism so usually for this no localization studies are required mainstay of treatment is your renal transplantation and medical management with calcium and vitamin d replacement and phosphate binders is a bridge to transplantation so use of calcium intake has reduced the requirement for surgical intervention and subtotal parathyroid remains the surgical intervention of choice when indicated right now regarding your tertiary hyperparathyroidism so this is a persistent autonomous hypercalcemic hyperparathyroidism occurring after kidney transplantation so guys the easier way to remember your three types of hyperparathyroidism would be primary that means the defect is in your parathyroid gland secondary you can remember it is a renal defect third it is a post renal transplant i think if you apply this basic concept you shall be able to solve your various questions on your primary secondary and tertiary hyperparathyroidism now diagnosis is made by demonstrating an elevated total or ionized calcium with an associated elevated or unsuppressed pth and a reduced phosphate occurring at least one year post renal transplantation localization studies are not required but a focus neck ultrasonography may confirm the presence of nodular enlargement and surgical intervention remains the mainstay of treatment and involves a subtotal parathyroidectomy so these are your few important points regarding your tertiary hyperparathyroidism and now regarding your surgical intervention i would want you to remember this particular table for your primary hyperparathyroidism as the questions are frequently asked from this table so measurement of serum calcium that is less than 0.25 above the upper limit of normal skeletal is the vertebral fracture or a t score of minus 2.5 and lumbar spine total hip femoral neck or distal one third of radius and then you have your renal which is creating clearance less than 60 ml per minute and age in less than 50 years they normally given your options age more than 50 years so please remember it is age less than 50 years right now examine a favorite topic pheochromocytoma now we have moved down to adrenal adrenal i would want you to focus specifically on one topic which is the pheochromocytoma so it is a neuroectodermal tissue of adrenal medulla now extra adrenal parasympathetic ganglia is known as paraganglioma now 90 percent of these patients are going to present you with headache palpitation and sweating now what is the most common symptom now this is as per the table on bailey and love now if you're given a hypertension that is most common if it is given in options as paroxysmal hypertension, continuous hypertension and headache, please remember in that case it is headache. If you look, headache is 60 to 90 percent, hypertension is 80 to 90 percent. So the answer over here for the most common symptom is hypertension. However, if in the options they have given you paroxysmal hypertension, continuous hypertension, headache and sweating so in that case you see 60 to 90 percent is much more than continuous and paroxysmal so in that case your answer should be headache now many would uh, argue symptom sign but then let's stick to the bailey and love this is the table which is given in bailey and love so let's not deviate from that right now investigation of choice is urine 24 hours free metanephrine radiological investigation of choice is your mri and your pre-op conditioning is required for which alpha blockers followed by beta blockers you never give the beta blockers first as there is an unopposed action of your alpha adrenergy and your treatment would be your lab open adrenalectomy now another important concept is regarding the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors 
right so you have this table which i think is going to solve almost all the questions of your pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors so if you have insulinoma so if you look at the presentation weakness sweating tremor tachycardia anxiety uh, fatigue uh, dizziness disorientation and seizures then you have gastrinoma so in gastrinoma you have gastrinoma you have intractable or recurrent peptic ulcer disease complications of peptic ulcer and diarrhea now non-functional tumors that is again obstructive jaundice pancreatitis epigastric pain duodenal obstruction and weight loss and fatigue the questions that have been framed have been from leukoma so you have your migratory necrolytic skin rash glossitis stomatitis angioculitis diabetes severe weight loss and diarrhea right so apart from that so this table can actually give you a hint to solve a lot of questions for example if in the presentation you have said about cholelithiasis then you can actually think of somatostatinoma right so these are your few of the important pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors which i would want you all to remember and please remember if you look at the malignancy percent over here the most chances of malignancy is with acth tumor and the incidence the most common is your insulinoma right so please remember the most common being the insulinoma and the maximum chances of mal malignancy is for your ACTH oma now another important question regarding your men syndrome so we have two types of men syndrome men 1 and men 2 now men 1 is because of your men 1 gene which is your tumor suppressor gene and men 2 is because of red which is your proto oncogene right now the location of men 1 gene is on your chromosome 11 and men 2 is on your chromosome 10 now you need to remember one important point that is a strong genotype or the phenotypic association with the MEN2. Now the association of your MEN type 1 is your parathyroid, pituitary, pancreas and your other tumors like your bronchial, thymic, gastric carcinomide, lipoma, facial angiofibroma and adrenocortical tumors. In parathyroid we have hyperplasia much more common than adenoma, pituitary, anterior is much more common in worm and the most common lesion is your prolactinoma. And in pancreas, you have most common gastrinoma, and most common cause of death is your pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, right? Uh, and in case of MEN2, we have MEN2A and 2B. MEN2A includes a medullary carcinoma, thyroid, pheochromocytoma, hyperparathyroidism, Hirschsprung disease, and your cutane lichenous amyloidosis. The most common location is in your interscapular area and the extremities. Now in case of M2B, you have your pheochromocytoma mucosal neuroma with the most common location being the lips and the buccal mucosa gi neuromatosis marfanoid habitus megacolon and constipation now need to remember this two as one liners and that is your familial mtc which is just meant to uh sub variety of men two and where mtc occurs in isolation and in case of simple you have mtc with pheochromocytoma only now i have definitely rushed around to this topic the men syndrome video has been explained in detail and is available in your game pg app youtube channel so those who are finding any difficulty at this point in your men uh, syndrome please take a look at that video in the game pg youtube app now in endocrine we move down to the last section which is the breast now again any patient of breast you need to do a triple, ass uh, triple assessment now triple assessment would include your history and clinical examination followed by an ultrasonographic or a mammographic that is a radiological evaluation followed by your histopathological examination right now i have just taken an important table regarding your breast imaging reporting and data system now this table has been multiple times asked in your exam so they can actually ask you a highly suggestive of malignancy is what score of Birads or Birads or they can ask you Birads 4 is negative, benign, probably benign or suspicious. So this could be the form of questions that are asked. So assessment uh, category 0 is assessment is incomplete, probability of malignancy is not applicable, need for additional imaging. Category 1 negative essentially 0%, routine annual screening mammography for women over the age of 40 years. Benign finding that is essentially 0%, routine annual screening mammography for women over age 40 years. Probably benign finding that is more than 0 but less than 2%, initial short term follow up usually 6 months examination. Now suspicious abnormality, now you have 4A where your findings are intervention with the suspicious of malignancy, 2 to 10 biopsy should be considered. Now in cases of 
uh, intermediate suspicions of malignancy you have 10 to 50 percent and moderate concern with high suspicions of malignancy you have 50 to 95 percent highly suggestive of malignancy is 95 and known biopsy proven malignancy is 6 percent where you definitely need to go for a treatment because you have already proved the diagnosis now there is another important classification which is the molecular classification now this comes in your HP classification, right? Now in your histopathological along with your immunohistochemistry, when you apply your IHC markers, you would be getting this molecular classification of the breast cancer. Now important point to remember is your Claudine low, which is again your triple negative with Claudine low. So this is a recent new addition in your Bailey and Love 20th edition. Apart from that, luminal A, you have your hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, KI67 low. Luminal B, you have positive negative and high so main difference between a and b is the ki67 which is the marker of proliferation and it is high in case of luminal b now basal type is your triple negative and you have her2 enriched which is your her2 positive with ki67 high right now again a new addition in your baby and love is your nodular breast you need to remember the scale which is your cardiff black now nodularity scale which is a five point ordinal scale now it creates nodularity, nodularity between zero to four and the, it is an objective measurement of your nodularity now uh, this scale has been validated so if you look over here at this lucknow cardiff uh, breast nodularity scale so you see zero is normal right one is your minimal two uh, is your mild three is your moderate and four is your severe nodularity right and if there is requirement of any treatment you would require tamoxifen and omeloxifene right so this is the sort of uh, nodularity scale where you can see in case of minimal it's more towards this side mild it's increasing and encroaching the center moderate it's uh, involving the both the centers and severe where it is involving almost the entire breast right now the fibroadenoma so the benign breast lesions are again your favorite uh, topics for your examiner so let's just read uh, read the most important points and that should be able to solve most of the questions being asked from here so fibroadenoma most common cause of lump in women age 15 to 25 years arises from the hyperplasia of the epithelium has a well-defined capsule and regression with anti-estrogen drug has been seen with your tamoxifene and hormoxifene right and giant fibroma is said to be a size of more than five centimeter you can look at this image over here so the incision that they have mentioned over here is your gallier thomas incision now relative risk of fibroadenoma 1.5 to 1.7 if simple 3.4 to 3.7 if epithelial hyperplasia and 3 to 4 for complex with family history particularly of your lobular carcinoma now when you will go for surgical excision when the age is over 30 years suspicious features of imaging uh, like uh, microbiation or tp on histology size more than 5 cm family history of breast cancer and patient's preference now you need to remember this age and size because these are your two important things where usually they will twist the options and give it to you now excision in elderly should uh, also include the rim of normal tissue as it may contain some malignancy or phylloid cell so this is one additional point which has been added in your recent baby and love so please make sure that you remember this point as it can come as a true or a false statement now next is your phylloids so phylloids is known as your cystosarcoma phylloids usually over 30 years overlying skin is ulcerated now this ulceration is because of the pressure necrosis now they are mobile on chest wall and rarely infiltrate the skin now it is a true mixed neoplasm containing your epithelial and mesenchymal components now classification according to the histological behavior is based on your mitotic rate tumor margin and pleomorphism where benign is less than 4 mitotic rate tumor margin is pushing pleomorphism and mild in case of borderline it is 5 to 9 moderate and tumor margins and your pleomorphism is also moderate and in case of malignancy it is more than 10 high power fields or with infiltrative tumor margin and severe pleomorphism right so wide local excision needs to be done with a 2 cm margin systemic chemotherapy would be required for your malignant phylloids and post-op radiotherapy is recommended for your recurrent or your malignant phylloids tumor now this is an example of image of your phylloids tumor 
right now again a new entity which has been added in your bailey and love that is your igm idiopathic granulomatous mastitis so this is a benign condition a self limiting condition usually seen in your young paris women within first few years after pregnancy now this has association with corny bacterium crop in steadity right now it presents as a single or a multiple central or peripheral inflammation breast mass with or without abscess formation now this is associated with skin ulceration nipple retraction sinus formation pudy orange and axillary lymphadenopathy and it usually mimics cancer now needle biopsy is required for the diagnosis of igm tissue aspirate for gram stain afb and fungal now the differential diagnosis would include your tb fb uh, foreign body reactions and your sarcoidosis now symptomatic and in those with infection you would require nsaids and antibiotics in tb endemic countries you would need to avoid anti tubercular as blanket therapy until it is confirmed by your gene expert now if you have your persistent symptom you treat the patient with steroids plus minus methotrexate now if there is a major uh, mild duct excision uh, required for your features of mammary gland fistula now excision of chronic abscess uh, cavity performed in patients with recurrence right so this were your few benign conditions the important benign conditions which i wanted to discuss apart from this you definitely have more as like your uh, inflammatory breast abscess so those things uh, need to be remembered as well as the most common agent is your staphylococcus or or yes and you can remember that current uh, treatment plan for the breast abscess is your usg guided drainage rather than your surgical Great. So that is one additional point which I need you all to remember. And then coming down to the breast cancer, in a breast cancer, I would be just discussing a few tables uh, over here. So the first table would be the indications of the genetic risk evaluation. So when you will be requ uh, requiring a genetic uh, risk evaluation in case of breast cancer, an individual at any age with a known pathogenic likely pathogenic variant in a cancer susceptibility gene within the family. Breast cancer diagnosis at the age less than 50 years, TNBC diagnosed age at the less than 60 years, two breast cancer primaries, then you have breast cancer at any age with one or more relative with the breast cancer diagnosed 50 years, invasive ovarian cancer, male breast cancer, then you have a male breast cancer itself is an increased risk, breast cancer at any age with two or more affected relatives and then you have your any individual with a personal family history of three or more of the following which includes your breast cancer, colon cancer, lobular breast cancer and the other forms of cancer which you can read from the table. This table was also even shared as a form of a question in your Instagram channel of Game PGR. So in case you guys are not following, make sure that you follow the Instagram channel as we have been discussing this important tables in our social media platform right so this table is very important please do remember and do not get confused over here with the ages it's tnbc age less than 60 years and breast cancer diagnosed age less than 50 years and two or more breast cancer primary so these are your most important uh, confusion areas from where the questions are framed now Regarding your breast cancer in pregnancy, now it is associated with triple negative breast cancer. In suspected mesh, MRI without gandelium contrast is used. In first and second trimester, MRM is preferred. Now, SLMB with low dose with technetium tax surfer is safe for fetus. So, if you want to do a central lymph node biopsy with this, it can be done. There should be no chemotherapy in the first uh, trimester. 5 fluorouracil should be avoided. And preferred agents are anthracyclines and taxanes. Now, for the prognosis. <coughs> You have your disease factors and the patient factors. Now in your disease factors, you have your stage of tumor, stage of disease, axillary lymph node involvement, grade of tumor, histopathological variant. So the metaplastic carcinoma is your aggressive. HER2 new presence of lymphovascular extensive DIC, DCIS component, high uh, KI67 index. Now patient factors, you have younger in age, premenopausal woman, BRCA associated tumor, family, family history of breast cancer, Prior history of breast cancer, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, and uh, failure to complete the intended treatment. So, these are your some of the prognostic factors. And then we have another 
uh, feature which is the angiosarcoma that arises from the endothelial cell lining the vascular lymphatic channel associated with prior radiotherapy poor prognosis now apart from this i would want you all uh, to discuss a few important points with you all with breast cancer now in case of a locally advanced breast cancer there is a concept of new adjuvant chemotherapy right so new adjuvant chemotherapy is basically to reduce the size of the tumor so that it can become visible for your bcs but it need not always shrink in size right so there might be need of mrm now how do you know whether it shrinks or not there is a criteria to evaluate which is a resist criteria resist which is response evaluation criteria in solid tumors right now another important thing which i need to remember uh, which i want you all to remember is regarding your inflammatory breast cancer i'm pretty sure you all know but then again just to emphasize the important point that there is the involvement of your subdermal lymphatics over here right so subdermal lymphatics are involved now because of this you have your body orange a uh, feature seen in case of your inflammatory breast carcinoma right so this were your few important potential and previously asked topics and questions and important points from your endocrine section so now we'll go to the last lab where we'll be discussing your vascular git and urology section now we shall be discussing some important points regarding your vascular surgery followed by a few important points from thoracic surgery before moving into abdomen and the urology so in mesentric uh, in vascular surgery mesentric ischemia now acute mesentric ischemia is basically thrombotic or embolic now the embolic occlusion is because of the embolus that mainly travels because of any cardiac issue now the embolic occlusion is going to lead to your severe sudden abdominal pain vomiting and diarrhea now the investigation of choice in this scenario is going to be your cect whole abdomen now what would you do the treatment would be your resection of the dead bowel embolectomy of sma and if needed they might be required of a second relook laparotomy now in case of a non occlusive uh, acute mesenteric ischemia you have your excessive sympathetic activity during your systemic hypotension as a result of which there is your vasospasm now the treatment includes your papaverine injection and your prostaglandin e1 now in case of your chronic mesenteric ischemia you have your asymptomatic occlusion at one or more vessel now it is usually referred to as your abdominal angina now the features of this include your cetophobia postprandial abdominal pain melanoma and diarrhea now the treatment includes your surgical and your endovascular treatment so this were your few important points regarding your acute mesenteric ischemia so you usually get a clinical based scenario question where you are asked regarding what is the diagnosis right now coming down to the next important topic a small topic which is your aneurysm now this is the dilation of your localized segment of the arterial system that is usually more than 50% increase in the diameter now the classification of aneurysms would be on the basis of wall it is true or false now the true uh, aneurysms are those where you have three layers that is your intima media adventitia whereas false are those where you have your single layer of fibrous tissue now morphology you have your fusiform and saccular and on the basis of etiology you have your atheromatous mycotic collagen disease and your traumatic now the most common large vessel type of aneurysm is your abdominal aortic aneurysm and the aneurysm measuring the twice the size of the corresponding normal vessel have the chance of becoming symptomatic so basically it is the size measuring twice the normal size right and then when would you require an operation in asymptomatic when you have size more than 5.5 cm so that was an indication for surgery and the morphology is best assessed by your ct scan and open surgical uh, repair is un uh, 
repaired is less contraindicated uh, that is reserving eva is high risk patients and your hostile abdomen so open surgical repair is usually done unless it is contraindicated until reserving your eva for your high risk patient and your hostile abdomen now regarding your management of your ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm it would be your early diagnosis immediate resuscitation maintaining systolic blood pressure but make sure that you do not make the blood pressure more than 100 mm of hg urinary catheter cross match blood and rapid transfer to your operating room now eva should be uh, considered as a suitable for your ruptured an aortic aneurysm as a first line right now there is another table which has been added in your recent billion love edition which is your classification of your endo leaks so your type 1 is your persistent filling of your aneurysmal sac owing to an infective seal at the proximal or distal end of the stent graft proximal would be 1a and distal would be 1b then you have your type 2 which is a persistent filling of the aneurysm sac owing to the retrograde flow of blood from the aortic collateral then you have your type 3 which is a persistent filling of the aneurysmal sac owing to the structural failure of the stent graft. Now it is as a result of component disconnection that is 3A and as a result of stent fabric tear it is 3B. Then you have your type 4 which is a persistent filling of the aneurysm sac owing to your stent graft fibric porosity and you have your type 5 which is your endotension now over here you have your persistent filling of aneurysm sac without any evidence of type 1 to 4 of endo leak so this is a new addition in your barium love so be uh, prepared to be getting a question from one the classification of the endo leak now again uh, a very small topic yet a very high yielding topic is your aortic dissection so this is a defect or flap in the intima of the aorta as a result of which the blood tracks into the aortic tissue splitting the medial layer and creating a false lumen. Now it is most common in your ascending aorta which lies just distal to the left subclavian artery. Now it is much more common in male compared to females and age is usually 50 to 70 years. Now, predisposing factors for your aortic dissection include your age, hypertension, Marfan syndrome, pregnancy, giant cell uh, connective, dish or, uh, con connective tissue disorders like your Ehlers Danlos syndrome, giant cell arteritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, coarctation of aorta, Turner or your Noonan syndromes, and aortic ganglation site uh, following your previous cardiac surgeries. So, these are your few of the risk factors or the predisposing factors for your aortic dissection. Now the clinical features, the clinical features, you have your classical features as your tearing interscapular pain. Now if this dissection descends distally down the aorta and spiral to involves the renal arteries, then what will you find? You will find your renal pain and renal failure. If it is mesenteric arteries, you will find features of abdominal pain and bowel angina. If spinal arteries, you might find patient presenting to you with paraplegia and iliac arteries would lead to leg pain, pallor or acute limb ischemia now they also may track proximally to involve the head neck neck vessels coronary vessels and your aortic root now, if they involve the coronary vessels they may lead to myocardial infarction now regarding your classification remember you need to remember your two classification which are your stanford and your d bakey classification right so stanford classification of aortic dissections are whether it is involving the ascending aorta or not so now when we are talking about Stanford it is A or B so if you see over here B now if in type B ascending aorta is not involved in type A ascending aorta is involved now in case of your Stanford uh, uh, sorry here yeah. in case of your db key classification you have your type 1 now type 1 is your ascending plus descending aorta type 2 is only your ascending and type 3 is your descending so db key type 1 is your ascending plus descending type 2 is your only ascending and type 3 is your descending right and now this is actually db keys type b or uh, sorry type b of stanford 
and this is type A of Stanford. Now, uh, another very important feature in X seen in X-ray is your widened mediastinum. So this is going to want to be one of your diagnostic findings, which if you find is going to hint your diagnosis towards your aortic dissection. Now diagnosis is confirmed by the CT scan and the treatment would include your BP control and type A would in, uh, involve your surgery intervention and type B would usually be your conservative treatment. Now coming down to the vascular part, now first in arterial. Now you need to understand this important concept of intermittent claudication. You must have got a lot of patients in your outdoors or in your ward clinics of your peripheral arterial disease. So let's understand what an intermittent claudication is. It is usually the result of your anaerobic muscle metabolism. So it is a cramp like pain that is first point brought on by walking. It is usually not present on taking the first step. Now, if it was first step, it was actually an osteoarthritis. And then it is relieved by taking rest for less than five minutes. Now, in case of if, what, if it was a spinal stenosis, then your rest requirement would have actually been more than five minutes. So, these are the few important points of intermittent claudication that you guys need to remember. Now this muscle group affected by claudication are usually one level below the level of claudication and the most common uh, vessel affected is your superficial femoral artery causing a posterior calf pain. Now regarding your rest pain, so this is a continuous dull type of pain which is not relieved by the usual dose of analgesics which persists for more than 14 days that is around 2 weeks. Now, the ulceration and gangrene, the ulceration is usually a sign of severe arterial insufficiency and you can see over here, uh, uh, image showing the gangrene, the gangrenous changes of the great toe and the toe adjoining. Now, another important concept is of your critical limb ischemia. So you have your questions being framed from your critical limb ischemia. So it is a persistently recurring rest pain requiring analgesia for more than two weeks or Ulceration or gangrene of foot or toes with ankle systolic blood pressure less than 50 mm of Hg and toe systolic pressure less than 30 mm of Hg. So these are your few basic concepts of your arterial disorders which I want you all to know because what happens is that in order in order to like read a lot of MCQ points and MCQ books we actually tend to skip on this basic point and the questions are being actually picked up nowadays from this important topics. Now again this another table is very important almost all exams have had got questions from this table so the clinical findings to the site of the disease so in case of iotoiliac obstruction this claudication in the buttocks thigh and calves femoral and distal pulses is absent in both limb brewing over the iotoiliac region and most importantly Lerich syndrome that is iotoiliac obstruction with your impotence now if it was an iliac obstruction you would be finding a unilateral claudication in the thigh and sometimes the buttock brew over the region unilateral absence of your femoral and distal pulses now if femoral popliteal uh, obstruction you have a unilateral obstruction in the claudication in the uh, calf region femoral pulse is palpable with your absent unilateral distal pulse now in case of distal obstruction you have your ankle pulses absent whereas femoral and popliteal pulses will be present and there will be claudication in the calf and foot so this is again a very five star important table where you are just basics would help you to solve most of the questions right now another examiner favorite is your Berger disease which is your vasculitis involving your medium and small vessels it may occur both in your upper limb and the lower limb it usually involves arteries veins and nerve now, there is a criteria to diagnose your Berger disease, which is your Shinoya criteria. Now, the Shinoya criteria is the onset before the age of 50 years. Smoking must be present, infrapropriteal artery occlusion, unilateral involvement, and absence of atherosclerotic factor other than smoking. So, this were your important points with respect to your arterial disease. Yes. You might be thinking that this question, that question regarding your Rutherford classification. Yes, Rutherford classification is also important. I have not included because the tendencies 
uh, it's not that it cannot be asked it can definitely be asked in your exam so please make sure that you read that uh, too before your exam but then for this uh, class coverage i have just tried to add some basic and the most commonly asked question and for this rutherford classification what i'll do is i'll try to make a video and upload in the game pg youtube channel so where you can uh, check on it so if you find any topics that you see that is important and has been missed i would again repeat guys please feel free to drop a message or an email or in our comment section we'll definitely come up with the part for it now in the venus uh, disorders what i would want you all to remember is the cep classification now cep classification you have to remember the main the clinical so before going to the clinical let's take a look at the etiological anatomical and pathophysiological etiological is congenital primary secondary not specified now anatomical is the superficial vein as ap is the perforating vein ad is a deep vein and an is your not specified pathological is pure pr reflux obstruction and pn not specified now clinical So, so you have some direct questions, or you have a clinical based scenarios where they have given a particular description, and they would want you to know what is the C classification. So, C zero is your no visible signs of venous disease. C one is your spider veins or telangiectasia or your reticular vein. So, varicose vein is actually C two. C three is varicose vein with edema. Now, C four A is pigmentation and eczema. C four B is your lipodermatosclerosis or atrophy blanchy. Four C is your coronophthalmatosia, which is a malleolar flare, a fan-shaped pattern of telangiectasia on the ankle of foot. C five is your heel venous ulcer, and C six is your active venous ulcer. right so this is again a five star important topic the last session had a question again from the cp classification even the prior session of fmg exam had a session on this so please make sure that you revise your cp classification now again this are some of your image based so if you can see in this particular image which i have ticked right now so it is your telling a uh, telling ectasia where you have your thread veins or the spider veins so this is a tiny intradermal venules which are measuring around less than 1 mm now you see over here uh, the topmost over here so you can see over here the lipodermatosclerosis changes so what are dip lipodermatosclerosis these are your chronic inflammation and the fibrosis of the skin and the cutaneous tissue right whereas your atrophy blanches your localized area of the trophic white skin then you have your this image showing your pigmentation uh this image is showing your painless groin swelling which is your saphena varix and then you have your varicose which is more than 3 mm in size right so in varicose vein you need to remember this particular points uh, with respect to your cp classification right now regarding your investigations you have your duplex ultrasound scanning which is your reflux obstruction thrombosis pelvic source of infection and suitability of the incompetent superficial vein for differential treatment now regarding your management so if you have signs and symptoms of chronic venous sufficient insufficiency you have your conservative managed compression now you have a satisfactory response you continue the treatment if not then you go for a duplex scan now if it is a muscle pump dysfunction you need to plan for exercise program a no non acute obstruction you might require a venography and a venous stenting in case of reflux if it is a perforator you would require a subfascial endoscopic perforator surgery in case of deep veins you would require a valve reconstruction and in case of superficial you would require a venous stripping and a venous ablation now the question comes the gold standard treatment for the varicose vein in the current generation is your endovenous laser treatment right so endothermal ablation is your gold standard it is safer efficient quality super quality of life cost effective and it can be done in local anesthesia you use laser and radio frequency so in case of evla you can ablate any vein it is not used for any torturous vein now it can treat evla can treat that is laser can treat your perforators whereas radio frequency cannot it is inexpensive whereas radio frequency is expensive it can deliver target foam therapy whereas radio frequency is automated and learning curve is reduced now another important point with respect to your varicose vein is your tuminescent anesthesia which compresses vein into your uh, 
onto the treatment device and it hydro dissect the tissue such as the nerve away from the zone of injuries and it acts as a fleet heat sink mopping excess of thermal injury so this were your few points with respect to your arterial and the venous disorder now apart from this you have your venous ulcer now what i want you all to remember in your venous ulcer is regarding your most common accepted theory for venous ulcer and it is your ambulatory hypertension right now dvt must have been covered in your medicine topics you know what i would all you to remember is regarding your well score so in your well score they might ask you regarding the components so there are two beautiful tables regarding your well score make sure that you uh, revise them if not uh i'm not covered over here but what i'll be doing is that i'll be making sure that i'm going to cover this in your uh instagram of channel of your game pg app or in the youtube channel in the form of shorts so in case if you're not reading make sure that you follow our game pg youtube app channel or the instagram in order to get the access to this uh table and charts which i have not included over here but i shall be including them uh in form of either reels or as a post just before the exam because these tables have this tendency to be getting forgotten so just revising before the day of exam is actually going to help you right so now coming down to the thoracic and the cardiac part now there are not a lot of questions which are being asked because they are actually in overlap between your respiratory system which are usually covered but one specific question which is your surgeon's favorite to be asked in exam is regarding thymoma so it is the most common mediastinal tumor it is related to myasthenia gravis what is the only reliable indicator of malignancy in thymoma is the capsular invasion thymomectomy is usually done for more than 5 cm if small then you can actually go for a video assisted thoracoscopic surgery now this is the one of the most important uh, question asked that is your masauka classification is used for your thymoma right now in case uh, now before that these are your some common tumors anterior mediastinum thymoma lymphoma germ cell tumor middle systema lymphoma mesenchymal tumor superior lymph, uh, mediastinum includes your lymphoma thyroid and parathyroid posterior mediastinum includes your neurogenic tumor cystic lesions and mesenchymal tumor now apart from this in your cardiac surgeries you need to know the fetal circulation which has been covered in your pediatric surgery and your valve defects and the tetralogy of fallot and all these points have been covered in your pediatric section i believe if not just let me know what i'll do is i'll post a video in a separate form what i want you all to know is regarding your bypass surgery right in your bypass surgery now the most common question that have been asked is regarding your venous graft now in your venous graft you guys you need to remember it is your saphenous vein that we take okay and in case of arterial graft right now the current status is regarding your left internal mammary artery so this are your most common venous graft and the most common arterial graft that are used so this is with all that i wanted to discuss regarding your cardiothoracic and your vascular surgery so please do not miss on this particular points now uh, we move down to the next section which is your abdomen right now in abdomen itself is a huge section itself right so you have books completely on one one particular topic so what i have done over here is like from each section i have taken the most high yielding topics to be discussed over here and again as i have told you if you want any other specific focus on topic you may just let me know but over here we'll be just discussing a few important points in order to cover the entire abdomen making sure that we touch them right so we begin our discussion with hernia so first regarding hernia the anticipated question or an expected question is regarding the ehs classification which is the european hernia society classification so if it is primary you say it to be p recurrent it to be r lateral you say it to be l medial m femoral f and defect size in finger breadth in the 
uh, value of 1.5 centimeter now with inguinal hernia there are questions which are actually uh, framed from the anatomy of the inguinal hernia so for this anatomy of inguinal hernia you can actually find the question in the game pg youtube app channel or you can even find the video in my youtube channel where i've actually explained the anatomy part also which is going to help you to solve the questions from anatomy in case if you have not revised in your anatomy section now operations for inguinal hernia now you might be asking what is the purpose of this question now if you remember a while back i was teaching incision so yes they just ask you directly questions based on incision which is the type of operation done right so open suture repair is bessini shoulders disorder malignant open flat mesh repair is lich uh, lich uh, tensin then open complex mesh repair not recommended nowadays is mesh plugs and hernia system and then you have your open preperitoneal repair which is just topa repair and laparoscopic repair or robot that is tap and tap now with tap and tap coming you need to remember two important triangles now this are your examiner favorite again which is the triangle of doom and triangle of pain my triangle of doom it is medially by vast difference laterally by vessels of spermatic cord and inferiorly by your peritoneal reflection now the contents includes your external iliac vessels femoral nerve and genital branch of femoral nerve now in case of triangle of pain you it is bounded medially by the gonadal vessels laterally by the peritoneum and superiorly by the iliopubic tract so the contents of this include your lateral femoral cutaneous nerve femoral branch of genital femoral nerve and femoral nerve so this is very important with respect to your hernia you need to know the anatomy you need to know the surgeries and you need to know this two important triangles right now let's take a step ahead now regarding a femoral hernia again the anatomy part the femoral canal so it is laterally by your femoral vein anteriorly by your inguinal ligament posteriorly by your iliopectoneal ligament and medially by your lacunar ligament right so this are your boundaries of your femoral canal and femoral canal is exploited by your femoral hernia now it is more common in women compared to males because female pelvis has different shape which increase the size of your femoral canal and it is obviously less common than the inguinal uh, hernias now the question that can also be framed from femoral, femoral hernias regarding the surgery so again a group of 3 so this are your three surgeries which are required for femoral hernia repair now please remember best for emergency repair is your mac avd repair so this is your best for emergency repair so this three important incisions or uh, surgery names you need to remember which is lockwood lothesen and mac avd now regarding your esophagus now in esophagus i would want you all to remember for this particular topic for sure barrett's esophagus again being repeated over and over and there has been an addition of a recent new table so we'll take a look at that too so barrett's esophagus it is a known complication of gord now it is the proximal migration of the columnar epithelium in the lower esophagus extending 1 cm above the esophagogastric junction now the role of goblet uh, cells in the diagnosis has become controversial as recently stated in your recent edition of your 20th edition of billion law the last edition had told the goblet cells to be mandatory but then there is a controversy over here so for now you need to follow your 20th edition of billion law now the length of barrett is also a risk factor for neoplasia now there is a classification which is known as a pre classification which includes your circumferential and the maximal extent visualized on the endoscopy now, apart from that the risk factors for barrett esophagus includes your chronic gord symptom for more than 5 years advanced age of 50 years smoking central obesity and male gender so this are your risk factors for your barrett's esophagus now regarding the cancer progression in barrett's esophagus you have your low grade which is around 0.7% and in case of high grade you have your 7% progression into the cancer so again these values are very important now regarding your cetal biopsy protocol now cetal biopsy protocol you have your four quadrant random biopsy every 2 cm in addition to the targeted biopsy so please remember four quadrant biopsies every 2 cm in addition to the target biopsy 
now how will you treat you will essentially treat the patient same as in your you treat it for gastroesophageal reflux disease now this is the particular flow chart which i would want you all to remember so you have a flat columnar mucosa systemic cold biopsy now it's confirmed dysplasia by two independent pathologists now if there is no dysplasia then you repeat OGD for every three to five years now if there is no dysplasia and maximum length is less than three centimeter gastric metaplasia you repeat now if this length is three centimeter you consider the discharging now if maximum length is three centimeter and intestinal metaplasia now that was the gastric metaplasia where you were discharging but if it is an intestinal metaplasia you would repeat every three to five years now if the maximum length was more than three centimeter in that case you will repeat it for every two to three years not three to five years right now if it was indefinite for dysplasia you repeat the esophago duodenoscopy with maximal acid suppression if it is a definite dysplasia you would follow a low grade dysplasia or the high grade dysplasia uh, flow chart so if it is a low grade dysplasia you will do the esophagoscopy every six months until two consecutive evidence of your non-dysplastic buried esophagus and after that you follow your non-dysplasia flow chart now if you do and it is a high grade dysplasia then you take the patient for mdt discussion therapeutic intervention and the patient may require your endoscopic eradication therapy so friend this table is very uh, this chart is very important just need to follow the each step in order to solve the mcqs that can be framed from this right so now these are your some HP images which is showing your Barrett's esophagus, low grade dysplasia and your high grade dysplasia. Right. So now we're coming down to the motility disorders. So in motility disorders, there has been a recent change. The previous edition had given your Chicago classification with that is third edition. But now we have the fourth edition and the updated edi education of your Chicago classification now so let's try to understand this so what is the step one of your chicago classification <coughs> just a minute so the step one is to perform 10 wet swallows in primary position now if there is an abnormal median IRP, right, then you check for 100% absent peristalsis or all swallows are either failed or premature. If the answer is yes, then is it 100% failed peristalsis without panesophageal uh, pressurization, then it's achalasia 1. Now, is it 100% failed peristalsis with POP in more than 20% of swallows, then it is achalasia type 2. Is it more than 20% swallows with premature contractions and failed peristalsis may or may not be present? Then it is classified as achalasia type 3. Now, if this 100% abscess peristalsis or all swallows are either failed, is the answer was no, then you go for your step 2. Wet swallows in secondary position plus MRS or your RDC. RDC is your rapid drink challenge and MR is your MRS is your multiple rapid swallow. So if there is elevated lower esophageal sphincter IRP persistent in waning position plus just a minute. Yeah. So if it is an elevated LOS integrated relaxation pressure persisting in varying po uh, positions plus elevated pan esophageal pressuri uh, pre uh, pressurization and your intra bolus pressurization then it is an abnormal tb and it is an abnormal tbo or flip tbo is your tambarium esophagogram and flip is your functional luminal, Im uh, luminal imaging plantimetry then it is your OGJO esophagogastric junction outlet obstruction now if coming back to this particular uh, 
chart of your abnormal median IRP? If the answer was no, then you perform the second step that is your wet swallows in secondary position and your rapid drink uh, MRS which is your uh, multiple rapid swallows and your rapid drink challenge, right? So now again, if there is an elevated LOS RP in varying positions plus elevated your intra bolus pressurization or your pan esophageal pressurization then you again go back to this same chart of that is 100% absent peristalsis or all swallows are either failed or premature if the answer is no then you come down to whether there are failed peristalsis or not if yes then it is absent contractility if no more than 20% swallows with your premature contraction the answer is yes then it is a distal esophageal spasm if the answer is no more than 20 percent swallows with hypercontractility then yes it is a hypercontractile esophagus now more than 70 percent ineffective or 50 percent failed swallows then yes it is ineffective esophageal motility and if there is no evidence of disorder of peristalsis consider meal based challenge or symptom so yes you need to keep revising reading this table and because there is a potential chance of the questions being asked from this as it has been a recent update and uh, based on Chicago classification your know, last December session not December the prior session the last June session had questions on your insufficient motivated disorder so be prepared to get a question out from this particular session now regarding achalasia your most common age presentation is 30 and 60 years of age the clinical features are dysphagia regurgitation heartburn weight loss halitosis now, the classical triad is your dysphagia weight loss and regurgitation now again a new addition in your belly and love has been the clinical scoring for the achalasia which is your eckhart score the components include your weight loss dysphagia retrosternal pain and your regurgitation so this is your barium contrast study which is showing your rat tail appearance of your achalasia. Now the definitive diagnosis is by your HRM. HRM is your high resolution, high resolution manometry. Now the treatment is by medical therapy, calcium channel blocker, nitrates and 5 phosphodiesterase inhibitors, botulinum toxin, pneumatic dilation, Heller's myotomy and parolar endoscopic myotomy which is minimum 6 cm in esophagus and a 2 cm in gastric cardia. Now esophagectomy is required for your mega esophagus. Right. So this were your important points with respect to your motility disorders. Now. Uh, regarding your hypercontractile motility disorder, so DS, it is an incoord incoordinate, there is no incoordination, premature, rapidly propagated contraction of the esophagus. It presents with dysphagia and chest pain. It usually occurs in distal one third. There is hypertrophy of your circular muscle, not the longitudinal muscles, right? And you have your corkscrew, corkscrew appearance in your esophagogram so you can see over here this is your corkscrew appearance in the esophagogram right so now regarding your esophageal cancer so what i want you all to remember is this particular chart now the main question that is framed over here is that achalasia is your risk factor for your squamous cell carcinoma whereas your barrett's esophagus is your risk factor for your adenocarcinoma so i would want you all to remember this particular point now, apart from that esophageal carcinoma there is the role of your endoscopic ultrasound the treatment the treatment in terms of surgery would be a transhiatal esophagectomy or you have a two stage procedure or a three or two incision procedure or a three incision procedure right so those names are very important like your macion uh, procedures for your esophagectomy so in apart from this in esophagus what you all should remember is regarding your hiatus hernia so there are four types of hiatus hernia so type one is where your esophagogastric i'll just write it down for you so type one is where your esoph or you can just actually listen to it type one is your esophagogastric junction is displaced upwards type two where only the part of stomach dilated stomach goes upwards and the ogg remains normal in position type three in type three what happens is 
it is a mixture of type 1 and type 2 and in type 4 you have an another organ apart from the stomach usually most commonly involved is your colon right so apart from this the named surgeries in your esophagus again you can look at the reels which are in your uh, youtube channel of game pg app as well as it is in the game uh, youtube ch uh, channel my youtube channel where we have discussed this surgeries macchioin or inger surgery or the ival lewis esophagic tommy right so these are your few other important points which you need to remember now coming down to the next topic is regarding the stomach now in stomach the most frequently and the most important questions that are asked is including from the lymph node stations of the stomach so i have named all the lymph node stations which i would want you all to remember lymph node one station one is right cardia then you have your left cardia lesser curve 4 SA is your short gastric, 4 SB is your lab, left gastro, uh, gastro epiploic, 4 D is your right gastro epiploic, 5 is your suprapyloric, 6 is your infrapyloric, 7 is around your gastric artery, 8 is around your anterior hepatic artery, 9 is around your celiac artery. Now 10 and 11 is your most common confusion which you need to avoid over here right. So 10 is your splenic hilum and 11 is your splenic artery. 12 is your left hepatoduodenal. 12 BP is your posterior hepatoduodenal. 13 is your retropancreatic and 14 A V is your superior mesenteric vein. 14 A is your superior mesenteric artery. 15 is for your middle colic. 16 A is for aortic hiatus, a b2 is for pyreotic caudal and a2 b1 is for pyreotic middle now definitely this is a huge chart but what i would all want you all to remember definitely is your splenic hilum and artery and i would want you all to remember your retropancreatic and your hepato duodenal and others are quite easy do not make a mistake 10 is splenic hilum and 11 is splenic artery right now Again, a very important table. So this is much more of a physiological question, uh, phys uh, question from the physiology. But then I would want you all to remember this for sure. Now, gastric cell types, location and function. Cell type parietal location is body and secretion of acid and intrinsic factor. Mucus body and atrium and its function is to secrete mucus. Chief cell the location is body and the function is to secrete pepsin. Surface epithelial cells it is a diffuse location. And the function is to secrete mucus, bicarbonate, and prostaglandin. Entochromaffin like GD. So, entochromaffin like cells are in body and they secrete function histamine. G cells are in the antrum responsible for uh, secretion of gastrin. D cells are in body and antrum somatostatin. Gastric mucosal interneurons again are located in body and antrum and they have your gastrin releasing peptide. Enteric neurons is diffuse in location, calcitonin gene related peptide and others. And then you have your endocrine which is again located in body and function is ghrelin. So you need to mug up this table and remember because you have some questions specifically asked like gastrin. Right. So they usually ask you with respect to gastrin. It is secreted by your cell type G and where is it located? It is located in your antrum. Right. So this is your very important uh, aspect that is needed with respect to your gastric cell types, location and function. Now regarding your gastric cancer, I would want to discuss some specific classifications as the questions are usually framed from that. So first I have the Loren classification. Loren classification is divided into two intestinal and diffuse. Now each and every point has been asked in MCQ or may be asked in future. So intestinal is environment, all right, environmental, risk factor is environmental, it is familiar. Gastric atrophy, intestinal metaplasia are risk factors in case of intestinal gastric cancer, whereas blood type A is in uh, risk factor in case of diffuse type. Men is much more common in women in case of intestinal, women is much more common than men in case of diffuse. Now it increases the incidence with the age in case of intestine and whereas diffuse is much more common in your younger age group. Now intestinal is associated with your gland formation whereas diffuse is poorly differentiated and with signet ring cells. 
Now, intestinal has a hematogenous spread, whereas diffuse has your transmural and your lymphatic spread. Now, intestinal has your micro uh, satellite instability, whereas decreased E. catherine is seen in your diffuse type. And P53, P60 inactivation is common to both intestinal and diffuse. So this particular point of decreased E. catherine is actually a very important point which you should not forget. Right. So decreased E. catherine is seen in your diffuse type of lotting classification of gastric cancer. Now, what is early gastric cancer? So early gastric cancer is limited to mucosa or some mucosa which may be or without your lymph node involvement so you can look at this particular scene this is a johnson's classific japanese classification type 1 which is protruding type 2a which is elevated type 2b which is flat type 2c which is depressed type 3 which is ulcerated now you have your advanced gastric cancer where it infiltrates muscularis so this is a borman classification which is your polypoid ulcerating infiltrating and linitis plastica now i have again not discussed the tnm classification because those are the classification which you need to remember so i'll again give you a supplement of your tnm classification video which might which will be available in your game pg youtube channel so make sure that you go through that and i'll also make sure that the pdf is available to you guys so that you can keep revising so tnm from your head to toe each and every cancer shall be included in that pdf right so it is already in a preparation process so i think it should be available to you uh, before your fmg exams i'll make sure that it's available to you guys right so this is with respect to your gastric cancer now with respect to your gallbladder now gallbladder you have your acute cholecystitis chronic cholecystitis colloidal cyst now colloidal cyst is your important thing you need to remember is your dodani classification which is for your cole local cyst right so this classification again has been repeated uh, and discussed a lot many times i have not included this in my this particular video you can find the same in the game pg youtube app channel in case you don't find just let me know we'll share it over there right now what i wanted to discuss in gallbladder was your biliary injury so there's this particular classification which is known as your strasbess classification now class a now this are your injury to the small ducts in continuity with the biliary system with cystic duct leak now type b is your injury to sectoral duct without any consequent obstruction now type c is injury to your sectoral duct with obstruction and consequent by leak and option d is your lateral injury to the extra hepatic biliary duct now you have this bismuth part of classification which has not been included now e1 is your uh, uh, injury which is more than two centimeter distal to the bifurcation e2 is which is less than two centimeter to the uh, distal to the bifurcation now e3 is your structure at the bifurcation now e4 is involving only the uh, right structure involving the right and the left uh, bile duct and e5 would be your complete occlusion of the bile duct so this is a particular uh, classification is very important and has the potential to be asked in your upcoming exams now what are goals of therapy when you uh, have a patient with the bile duct leak the first is the control of infection or limiting inflammation which is achieved by your IV antibiotics or your percutaneous drainage. Then you have your clear or the thorough delineation of the anatomy. Now this is achieved with the help of MRCP or ERCP and you have to re-establish the biliary uh, enteric continuity which is via tension free mucosa to mucosa repair and doing by hepaticojejunostomy and transanastomotic stents. So these are your goals of therapy and if you look at this flow chart this is going to simplify your concept of bile leak so if bile leak happens you see the status of the patient if the patient is stable check the drain output if it is low output that is less than 200 ml you go for conservative treatment 
if it is high output that is more than 500 ml then you would go for an ercp or supportive care now if it is between 200 to 500 ml you actually go for a supportive care and plus minus 10 now then you review this patient after six weeks and to check for leak if it persists then you go for a hue and why hepaticojejunostomy else it would automatically seal up now in case of an unstable patient what you do is you check whether there is drain in situ or not if it is there you check whether it is functional or not now if it is not functional and if drain is not there you would go for a usg guided percutaneous drainage now if it is a functional drain then you go for a conservative treatment and the management of the cholangitis right so this would be your general overview treatment of the bile now in your gallbladder section you need to again remember a few important points a classification like tokyo classification so can anybody say what is the tokyo classification used for so yes tokyo classification is for your acute cholecystitis right so tokyo guidelines or you can say tokyo guidelines is for acute cholecystitis now uh, from your gallbladder so this are your major questions that are actually asked now apart from that the questions that are also asked is with respect to your cbd now for cbd you need to remember right that mrcp is your investigation diagnostic modality right now you do usually ERCP where you want diagnosis at the same time it is planned for a therapeutic treatment else usually MRCP is now for diagnosis. Now again in your CBD you have your primary CBD stones right so what are your primary CBD stones primary CBD stones are those which are formed de novo that is inside the CBD now you have your secondary CBD so what are secondary CBD stones? Now secondary CBD stones which come from gall bladder. Now you have your another concept of your residual and your recurrent. So in residual it is more than two less than two years right so these are your some of the other additional concepts of your common bile uh, of the uh, cbd stones that are usually asked now in case of pancreas we discussed the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors now what i would want you all to remember is regarding the serocystic neoplasm so i have made this chart which i think should simplify now if you take a cystic fluid now you have a low viscosity and a low ca then what you do is check the amylase level if it is high it is a pseudocyst if it is low it is a serocyst now if there is a high viscosity in high ca check the amylase if it is low it is mucinous if it is high it is interductal papillary mucinous neoplasm so basically the entire questions are usually revolving around the serocystic neoplasm of the pancreas now you have this another beautiful flow chart or the table which is taken from a Bailey law so you have a cystic neoplasm you investigate with the mrcp or with eus fna now it is uh, you send the fluid for ca cytology ca more than 192 indicates mucinous neoplasm now ipm or uh, intranectal papillary mucinous neoplasm or mucinous neoplasm so absolute indication for surgery include your carcinoma or high grade dysplasia solid mass jaundice enhancing mural more than 5 mm and main pancreatic duct dilated more than 10 mm now you guys should, should remember this particular values because they will actually twist the value like enhancing mural nodules more than 3 mm no that's not an indication for surgery enhancing mural nodules more than 5 mm is an indication for surgery main pancreatic duct dilated which is more than 10 mm now relative indications for surgery include your growth rate more than 5 mm serum c90 more than 37 main pancreatic duct dilated 5 to 9.9 mm cystic diameter more than 40 mm new onset diabetes mellitus acute pancreatitis and enhancing mural nodules less than 5 mm right so if it is an actual indication for surgery you would go for surgery if it is a relative indication for surgery you would see if it is an acceptable surgical risk with one or two indications or high surgical risk but more than two indications surgery high surgical risk with one indication you will monitor six monthly with clinical evaluation serum c19 and mrcp evs 
Now, if it is not an indication for surgery, you will monitor the patient with clinical evaluation, uh, serum C99 at MRCP and EUS. Now, a solid pseudo papillary neoplasm, you would consider a surgery. Cystic neuroendocrine neotumor, you will again consider a surgery. And a serous cyst neoplasm other than benign cyst, you can manage it conservatively. So, for pancreas, you need to have your focus mainly on your serous neoplasm and the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Now, there is an other recent entity which is being very famously asked in your MCQ, which is regarding your borderline resectable tumors of pancreas. So, what you need to remember is that in case of borderline resectable tumors of pancreas, you can actually go for a neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery or you can go for venous re, uh, resection where you have the facilities for the venous reconstruction some centers are also going suggesting for your arterial reconstruction also so please keep that in mind regarding your borderline resectable uh, tumors of the pancreas now in case of liver what i would want you to remember is the tumors of the liver specifically the benign tumors of the liver right because they are your favorite examiner topic so if you talk about hemangioma it is the most common solid tumor, most common benign. It is male is equal to female. OCP you not associated. Soft bluish red, spongy mass. Usually asymptomatic giant hemangioma is usually when it is said to be more than four centimeter. Now diagnosis first line is USG. MRI is much more useful compared to CT scan in case of hemangioma. Indication of surgery is rupture, giant hemangioma, unsymptomatic. Now. Slow contrast enhancement due to small vessel uptake in hemangioma is seen in your investigations. Now in case of your focal nodular hyperplasia, uh, hyperplasia. Now male is equal to female in case of hemangioma. In case of focal nodular hyper, female has a better preprogramming. Continuous, it contains hepatocytes and cup cells. It has a central steelhead scar, encapsulated, lobulated and septed mass. Now, the hallmark is your presence of your bile duct elements and the absence of your portal venous structures. Now, the look at over here, the hallmark is your presence of bile duct elements and absence of portal venous structures and central steelhead scar. Now, diagnosis is with the CT, MRI and your sulfur colloid scan and there is no malignant potential and you will not require any treatment. So, please remember the focal nodular hyperplasia, you require no treatment. Now, regarding your hepatic adenoma, so female is again more common than compared to male. It is strongly associated with your hepatic adenoma, is your strongly associated with your oral contraceptive pills. Now, this is one of the most commonly mistakes where students mark focal nodular hyperplasia. No, no. the uh, hepat it is OCP which is associated with your strongly associated with your hepatic adenoma now it is associated with your type 1 glycogen storage disorders diabetes mellitus the hepatocytes are present and cuffer cells are absent now in case of your focal and nodular hyperplasia you had cuffer cells also so uh, now the portal venous structures are present and the bile duct elements are absent Dino diagnosis is again by your mri or ccd scan and it has increased levels of alpha fetoprotein so hypervascular and heterogeneous on arterial phase and isodense and hypodense on portal phase as a result of av shunting acute hemorrhage you would go for an hepatic artery embolization resection for symptomatic mass and resection before a planned pregnancy so that is your treatment plan for your hepatic adenoma now apart from that in your liver i would want you all definitely to remember your ctp classification you cannot make mistakes in such questions because this are this have been like repeated like and in order to avoid mistakes in this all you need to do is keep revising keep revising keep revising right so child turquoise works classification bilirubin less than 34 34 to 50 more than 50 Albumin more than 35, 35 to 35, and uh, 3 is given for less than 25. Please remember the values over here, right? Gram, micropole, or micromole per liter. Then you have ascites, which is none, easily controlled and poorly controlled. Encephalopathy, which is none, grade 1 or grade 2, grade 3 or 4. And INR, you have less than 1.7, 1.7 to 2.2, and more than 2.2. So this is your child turquot per classification of your hepatocellular function in your cirrhosis. So the CTP score is actually very important for any exam. You need to remember they can actually ask you from this particular points. 
itself only right what are the components bilirubin albumin ascites and sulfuropathy i know and remember ctp a is 5 or 6 point b is 7 to 9 points c is 10 to 15 points so this is all about your important aspects of liver now apart from that we will also discuss this amoebic liver abscess so this is majority in the right lobe how does it present it would present to you as abdominal pain anorexia fever nitrates and malaise so the questions in your exam can actually be with the help of your ct scan or an ultrasound where you find the well encapsulated mass like this the causative agent is usually your endome of your histolytica right imaging methods are usg ct and your drugs treatment would be metronidazole atenidazole or your diloxide furinate which is 10 days to destroy your intestinal amoeba so and if it ruptures you would be requiring your peritonitis now apart from that another cystic lesion of liver that is very important is your uh, hydrated cyst so anybody and everybody should be actually knowing regarding this organism causing it if you do not know it make sure that you do not skip on it right so it is echinococcus granulosis granulosis right so now this is the particular classification of hepatic hydrate cyst which you should remember so cl is your cystic lesion which is the unilocular unilocular anipocystic lesion without internal echoes or septation ce1 is your uniformly anipocystic with fine internal echoes that represent proctosolysis after rupture of a vesicle called hydrated sand now ce2 is your cystic with internal septation representing the walls of the dorsus is described as multivesicular honeycomb cartwheel and rosette formation so honeycomb honey honeycomb cartwheel and rosette formation is seen in ce2 now ce3 is your transitional stage description of your daughter cyst 3a daughter cyst with detached laminal membrane 3b is your daughter cyst inside a solid matrix now ce4 is your inactive daughter cyst can no longer be seen mixture of hypoechoic and hyperechoic features like a bag of wool so these are your some one liners which can directly be put forward bag of wool is which stage c4 now c5 is a calcification of the wall either partial or complete so over here if you look over here hydrated sand is in c1 in c2 you need to remember honeycomb what uh, cartwheel and the rosette formation in c3 you need to remember your daughter cyst like now c4 bag of wool and c5 calcification i think if you remember this keywords it should help you to exclude most of the options and mark your correct answer now again these are your images which you can see over here regarding your hydrated cyst right now the next would be your bariatric surgery so the indications and the contraindications have been explained or multiple times in case you have having a difficulty again i would ask you to just drop in a message we shall share the video and you can actually find this videos even our game pg youtube channel now what i want to focus over here is the types of bariatric surgery now, there are three types of bariatric surgery malabsorptive restrictive hybrid now malabsorptive includes a bilopancreatic division on with or without during the switch Restrictive includes a vertical band gastroplasty, sleep gastrectomy, and laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding. And hybrid is your UNY and omega loop. So if you look over here, I've just taken this images. So this is an image showing your sleep gastrectomy, where your concerns are your staple line leakage and your symptomatic reflux, right? And uh, de novo Barrett's esophagus. Now if you look over here, this is a gastric bypass showing a short vertical less curvature right so your biliary limb is kept short so reduce vitamin and mineral deficiencies and length of rule limb is around 100 to 150 centimeter so now over here you have a gastric bypass with a longer vertical curvature so the main concern over here would be your biliary reflex induced gastritis now you have this adjustable gastric band so you have your pars flaccida which is your most common technique right now through the window of the lesser momentum band placed below the esophagogastric junction now this is again your important part where you have your biliopancreatic division with the deuterus switch variant and the single anastomo, uh, anastomosis due to 
आइगल बाईपास विथ स्लीव गैस्ट्रेक्टोमी सो यू लुक ओवर हियर द एलिमेंट्री लिम्ब इज हंड्रेड टू टू फिफ्टी सेंटीमीटर द कॉमन चैनल इज सेवेंटी फाइव टू वन ट्वेंटी फाइव सेंटीमीटर वेर एज इन केस ऑफ द सिंगल एनेस्टोमोस इज डून एनुअल बाईपास कॉमन चैनल इज अराउंड फिफ्टी टू थ्री हंड्रेड सेंटीमीटर सो मेन डिफरेंसेज इज हायर न्यूट्रिशनल कॉम्प्लिकेशन इन केस ऑफ अ बिलो पैंक्रेटिक डाइवर्शन ग्रेटर वेट लॉस दैन अदर प्रोसीडियर्स स्लीप एंड वॉट इज डन स्लीप गैस्ट्रिक्टॉमी डिविजन ऑफ द ड्यूडनम डिस्टली टू द पायलोडस फॉलोड बाई योर आइलियम डिविजन एंड ड्यूडनो आइलियोस्टॉमी एंड आइलियो आइलियोस्टॉमी नो ओवर योर स्लीप गैस्ट्रिक्टॉमी एंड एन टू साइड ड्यूडनो आइलियल एनेस्टोमोस सो वॉट इज द एडवांटेज ओवर योर यू हैव योर प्रिजर्वेशन ऑफ द पायलोडस एलिमिनेशन ऑफ वन मोर एनेस्टोमोसिस एंड यू हैव योर रिड्यूज ऑपरेटिंग टाइम सो द कॉमन चैनल क्वेश्चन कैन बी आस्क एंड ऑल्सो रिगार्डिंग वॉट इज डन इन योर सिंगल एनेस्टोमोसिस रिजनल बाईपास विथ स्लीप गैस्ट्रिक्टॉम नाउ रिगार्डिंग योर एस्टिमेटेड सर्जिकल कॉम्प्लिकेशन विद बेरियाट्रिक सर्जरी सो स्लीप गैस्ट्रिक्टॉमी यू हैव अर्ली लीक एंड लीक एट द एंगल ऑफ हिज इंटरप्रामल ब्लीड डी वी टी और द लेट कॉम्प्लिकेशन इंक्लूड जी ओ आर टी पैरट्स एंड वेट गेट Now, gastric bypass. You have anastomotic leak, intra-abdominal bleed, DVT, or uh, an unspecified obstruction, and you have internal hernia as late complications and chronic abdominal pain, malnutrition, anastomotic structures, and weight gain. Now, gastric band. You have assess both side infection, DVT, and pulmonary embolism, and the late complications would include band infection, tubing slippage, erosion, band uh, into stomach, uh, band intolerance, and failure to lose weight or weight regain. so this were your important points with respect to your bariatric surgery now in indications i would want you all to remember bmi more than 40 is an sure sure indication and bmi bmi more than 35 is indication along with the presence of comorbidities so this are two important questions that are actually asked right now regarding your inflammatory bowel disease so this important table if you just revise before your exam should help you to solve at least around 70 to 80% questions on inflammatory bowel disease uh, inflammatory bowel disease because they are actually mainly related to crohn's colitis and your ulcerative colitis so diarrhea so diarrhea is common in crohn's as well as ulcerative rectal bleeding is almost present in ulcerative colitis abdominal cramp is moderate to severe in crohn and mild to moderate in your ulcerative palpable mass at times is seen in crohn's but it is not seen in ulcerative colitis now anal complaints are frequent in case of crohn colitis whereas it is infrequent in your ulcerative colitis now your radiologic findings what you need to remember that toxic dilation is rare in case of crohn's and it is uncommon in case of ulcerative colitis Ulcers are usually linear or cobblestone fissures in case of Crohn's, whereas it is your collar button in case of ulcerative colitis. Now there are skip lesions which are seen in Crohn colitis, whereas in rectum extending proximally and continuously. Now ileal disease is again common in case of Crohn's, whereas it is rare in case of ulcerative colitis. Nodularity and fuzziness is present in case of ulcerative colitis, whereas it is absent in case of Crohn colitis. Now you have your proctoscopic finding where you need to remember that anal fissure fistula abscess is common in case of Crohn whereas it is rare in ulcerative rectal sparing is common in case of Crohn colitis whereas it is again rare in case of ulcerative now ulceration is linear deep scattered whereas it is superficial and universal in case of ulcerative colitis so apart from this you need to remember the monitor classification for the Crohn disease which includes your age at diagnosis a1 is less than 16 a2 is 17 to 40 a3 is more than 40 behavior is b1 non stricturing non penetrating b2 is stricturing b3 is penetrating and p is perianal disease modifier where you can add to b1 to 3 location l1 is ileal l2 is colonic l3 is ileal colonic l4 is your isolated upper gi tract so this is again a very important concept from the crohn disease not concept rather it is actually a direct straightforward question where you need to remember the name of the classification and the parameter they can actually put a clinical based scenario like a 18 year old boy presenting with a stricturing uh, lesion in the colonic region what would be your monitor classification as per the uh, monitor classification for the crohn disease now in your ibd you have one more important point which is your extra intestinal manifestation now it is related to disease activity include your erythema nodosum then you have your pyoderma gangliosum 
then you have your arthritis and then you have your eye complication arthritis and uveitis after ulcer amyloidosis you need to remember that arthritis is your most common extra intestinal manifestation right and unrelated to disease activity include your gallstones rectal renal calculosis primary sclerosing cholangitis chronic active hepatitis and your uh, sacroiliitis so the questions can be framed as which of the following is not related to disease activity which of the following is related to disease activity and which of this is the most common extra intestinal manifestation now moving down to the colon so this is your haggit classification for the polyp now you need to remember this particular classification for your pedunculated polyps where you have level 0 which is your non invasive right so level 4 0 is your non invasive then you have your level 1 which is invasion into the head of the pedunculated polyp right then you have your level 2 which is into the neck of the polyp and then you have your level 3 which is invasion into the stalk of the polyp and then you have your level 4 which is invasion into the base of the pedunculated polyp now in case of sessile polyp right so now this all polyp are a uh, level 4 in case of sessile polyp now apart from polyps what i want you to remember is the polyposis syndrome now specifically the familiar adenomatosis polyposis now it is presence of more than 100 colorectal uh, adenomas now extra colonic manifestation now you need to remember which are endodermal derivatives which are ectodermal derivatives and which are mesodermal derivatives now endodermal derivatives include your hepatoblastoma gastric fundi polyps and adenomas and the carcinomas particularly around the duodenal ampulla but also stomach small intestine thyroid and biliary tree now ectodermal uh, derivatives includes epidermoides pilomatrixoma congenital hypertrophy of retinal pigment epithelium and brain tumors whereas the mesodermal derivatives are desmoid tumors os tumors and dental problems now they have your 80% of your positive family history usually associated with mutation in the apc gene on the chromosome 5 lifetime increases uh, risk of colorectal is 100% so it is 100% in apc gene mutation and prophylactic surgery to prevent colorectal carcinoma uh, includes your colorectomy with ileorectal anastomosis total uh, proctocolectomy and an ileostomy and restorative proctocolectomy when an ile with an ile anal pouch anastomosis right other polyposis syndrome i would definitely want you to remember this polyposis syndrome because this are being frequently asked these days it is again hnpcc autosomal dominant risk of colorectal endometrium ovary st- uh, stomach and small intestine mutation includes in mlh1 ss2 msh6 and pmx62 now what i want you to remember is your amsterdam criteria three or more family members with the lynch syndrome related cancer two or more successful affected generation at least one tumor diagnosed before age of 50 years pap excluded and tumor verified by your pathological examination so this particular criteria need to be remembered pap excluded two or more successive uh, generations included at least one tumor before the age of 50 years and pap excluded now regarding your colorectal carcinoma most developed from which type of polyp adenomatous polyp now this is the adenocarcinoma sequence where i need to you all to remember the first one is 5q mutation or loss of ffp which is between your normal and hyperproliferative epithelium now k ras mutation is between your early adenoma and your intermediate adenoma then you have your p53 which is between your late adenoma and carcinoma now this p53 is actually your marker of invasion now between your intermediate uh, adenoma to late adenoma you have 18q loss also and in a hypermethylation has an effect on your early adenoma so saying for the evidence of the adenoma carcinoma sequence you have the distribution of adenoma similar to cancer larger adenomas are more likely to be dysplastic majority of early cancer adjacent adenomatous tissue adenoma are found in one third of specimen 
resected for colorectal cancer and incidence of colorectal cancer decreases within a screening program that involves colonoscopy and polypectomy so this has been asked as true and false statement questions right so please do remember this this can come even as an all of the above question now regarding the distribution please remember the maximum distribution is actually seen in the rectum followed by your sigmoid colon now regarding your uh, presentation so you have your right sided colonic carcinoma which will have a different presentation compared to your left sided colonic carcinoma so right sided you will have an abdominal mass melina diarrhea right lower quadrant abdominal uh, pain whereas left colonic you will have your alteration of bowel habit passage of blood or mucus to left sided abdominal pain and mass and acute or chronic obstruction now spread would be via your direct lymphatic and hematogenous spread now liver via portal vein is much more common compared to lung now duke staging is a is invasion but not breaching muscularis propria b is muscularis propria breach c is lymph node metastasis now regarding your tnm uh, so i've included the tnm of rectal cancer over here but i'll ensure that i'll make a tnm chart for all the cancers and give you very soon so t1 is invade into the submucosa t Two is into the submuscular propria. T three is non peritonealized pericolic tissues. T four is visceral peritoneum, and T four B is invading your another organ or structure. So you have your nodes N one or three. Uh, N one is one two three nodes involved. N two is your four nodes involved. M not is met no metastasis. M one is metastasis. M one. Uh, A is metastasis confined to one organ. M1B is metastasis to more than one organ. What you need to remember is M1C, which is your metastasis to peritoneum. Right now, regarding the screening, the ideal age is 50 years. Investigation of choice is your colonoscopy, pre-op evaluation. No more mechanical bowel preparation. Right. So these are your key elements of your EDAS program. We had discussed this when we began the session in your metabolic response to injury regarding your ERAS technique, so you have your pre-admission counseling, pre-op carbohydrate loading, avoidance of pre-op dehydration, avoidance of nasogastric tube, short-acting anesthetic drugs, avoidance of fluid overload, short transverse insertions, avoidance of opiate analgesia, maintenance of perioperative temperature, prevention of post-operative nausea and vomiting, early mobilization, early introduction of your oral fluids, diets and supplements, now early removal of unity catheters and continual audit of outcomes. Now regarding your surgery, so you have this uh, diagram over here, so showing your right, hemi uh, right hemicolectomy for your can cancers of cecum and ascending colon. So you have your left hemicolectomy for descending colon and your sigmoid colon. Extended right is done for your carcinoma transverse colon and splenic fracture and adjuvant CT is for your stage 3 and Duke C, uh, C which is your fluoropyrimidine agents and oxaloplatin. Right. Now, in case of rectum, the most BVI topic of rectum is your rectal prolapse. So it is of two types, mucosal prolapse or your full thickness prolapse. Mucosa, only mucosa, usually in children, after diarrhea, loss of weight and loss of fat, which can be associated with your cystic fibrosis, Hirschsprung disease and rectal polyp. Right. In adult, it is usually associated with your third degree hemorrhoid. The treatment in young children is usually by digital repositioning and some mucosal injection, whereas in case of adult, it is a local treatment and excision of your prolapsed mucosa. Now, full thickness rectal prolapse is usually with mucosa and submucosa, usually commences as intersusception of rectum. So, this is your key point to be remembered. Now, where does it start? It starts in the anterior wall of the rectum and supporting, supporting tissue are the weakest. Right, so this is an example of your full thickness rectal prolapse where the whole bowel uh, wall has protruded out through the anus. Right, now the treatment are two types of procedure pelvic and the abdominal. Pelvic is easy, less time, increased recurrence, and old patient includes thears wiring, delome, and perineal rectosigmoidal. Uh, rectosigmoidectomy in case of abdominal it is difficult increased time less recurrence young and fit patient resection rectopexy and suture rectopexy so they have asked you the questions on the procedures for your rectal prolapse uh, abdominal procedures and the pelvic procedures and now you uh, they have also been asking you questions regarding the images so you need to remember this is your delorme procedures 
now i would say at least remember the image this is the delom procedure this is your altimios procedures and this is your ventral mesh recto pexi right so this is with respect to your rectum the rectal cancer will have a lot of similarities with colorectal uh, colon cancer as usually it is um, studied as one entity colorectal cancer right so that um, important points which have been discussed for colon cancer should suffice your uh, preparation for this and apart from that if there is any doubt please do read and if you have to ask again you can drop a message or an email now regarding anal canal so this is a topic from where you know a lot of short topics and a lot of uh, one liners do come up so let's look at the first question which is usually from the embryology section of the anal canal that is your dentate line so you have your embryological junction between the endodermal and the ectodermal part of the anal canal so above the dentate line is your endodermal which is columnar sensitive to stretch internal iliac brings to internal iliac uh, lymph node and superior rectal vein to portal and below the dental line is ectodermal squamous somatic innervation sensitive to pain inguinal lymph node and inferior rectal vein to the systemic venous now apart from that uh, coming down to the anorectal malformations so what i want you all to remember over here is a few flow charts right because they have tendency to ask regarding the management so if it is a newborn male you will go for a perineal inspection now 20 24 hours then you will go for a re uh, where you will be evaluating regarding the spine kidney uh, urine analysis rule out esophageal atresia sacrament do an echocardiography then you do a reevaluation in the cross table lateral film now if it is a perianal fistula you go for an anoplasty if it is a rectal gas bilocox you consider a posterior sagittal anorectoplasty and if it is a rectal gas above coccyx you you do a colostomy so this is the type of management in case of your newborn uh, male now one more important one liner you can remember is wing spread right so wing spread classification is for anorectal malformation now in case of newborn female now you rule out the associated defect you do a perineal inspection now if it is a single perineal orifice cloaca you do a urology evaluation rule out hydrocolpus and do a colostomy and drain the hydrocolpus now if it is a perianal fistula you will need to do an anoplasty or an anodilation if it is a vestibular fistula you would require a primary repair or a colostomy now if there is no visible fistula then after 24 hours do a cross table lateral x ray if it is in low rectum do a primary repair if it is in high rectum you do a colostomy so if there is a question on anorectal malformation i think the modern day questions could generally be uh, centralized around these two charts or the flow chart which i have explained to you right now right now this is again a procedure which is done for pilonidal sinus so i would want you all to remember the procedure name the bascom procedure now this can come as basically an image based question right where you give a lateral incision and curettage only now this is what we had studied in the plastic also right a pilonidal sinus flap so this uh, a right so this is your cariadakis flap and your limbus flap so this first one is your cariadakis operation and then this is your lumbar procedure right you can see the rotational advancement flap over here so this three procedures are used for your pilonidal sinus so they can be image based question asking you what is your uh, what is the procedure called or they can ask you which of the following procedures are used for pilonidal sinus bascom procedure cariadakis and limbo now regarding your anal fissure now this is one of the most common topics or not topics sorry most one of the most common cases that we come across our opd so if you see the location of fissure is lateral you can consider it to be crohn's tb syphilis cancer hiv or aids and have to do investigations accordingly now if it is a midline then you go for a non operative management like topical nitrates and calcium channel blockers now for operative you need to remember you do a lateral anal sphincterectomy now if there is failure to heal then you consider examination anesthesia consider biopsy 
or the evaluation of sphincter if it is hypotonic you would go for a fissurectomy with advancement flap now if it is hypertonic you will go for a repeat sphincterectomy so this is with respect to your annual fissure now again they have asked questions lateral annual sphincter uh, sphincterectomy you need to remember now this is with respect to your annual fistula right fistula so last year they had asked you regarding the gold standard of investigation the gold standard of investigation so this is your mri now most common is your intersphincteric fistula right and then followed by you have your transphincteric and then you have your suprasphincteric and your extrasphincteric now what is this classification called parks classification so these are very few important one-liners where you should not be missing right now so i think this is all about your anal canal now a few important topics for the urology section this would be our last session for today right so first we have your renal cyst now there's a classification which is named as bosnoid classification now this is uh, as per the malignant potential of your cystic lesion so if you look over your class one there are no septa no calcification no solid component and no enhancement so this is has around zero percent chances of being malignant now type two there's a few hairline thin one less than one mm septa which is thin calcifications and well marginated so again again they have like zero percent chances of being malignant now two f they are well marginated no enhancement high attenuated lesion more than three centimeter totally intrarenal now this are six uh, month 12 months and five years follow-up is required for this case now in case of three where 50 percent are malignant so this are thick irregular or smooth uh, wall or septa they have measurable enhancement so partial nephrectomy or rfa in poor surgical candidates is needed now in case of category 4 it is 3 plus enhancing soft tissue components adjacent to but independent of wall or the septum so you would again require a surgical treatment so please remember category 2 f will are five percent chances of malignant and you would require it to be followed whereas category 3 are around 50 percent of malignant and you would require a treatment of partial nephrectomy now apart from this uh, in kidney you would need to remember the TB changes or the changes that occur in tuberculosis so we have this uh, urology section video for covering the neat previous year questions in your game PG YouTube app channel so which I would want you all to visit and make sure that you look over there right now apart from uh, this in kidney section regarding the kidney cancer uh, again it has been discussed multiple times i'm not included in this particular uh, session of today's so now if you want to know that please let me know we'll again have an add-on video for that uh, very soon and irrespective we shall be discussing the kidney cancer when we'll be discussing uh, tnm uh, stages of all the cancers which i'll be sharing the pdf very soon now regarding the torsion of testes so this is the twisting of the spermatic cord and its content as a result of which what happens is that testicular blood supply is compromised if untreated blood flow ceases and as a result of which testicle die now it is a surgical emergency now there are two types extravaginal and intravaginal extravaginal is usually limited to neonates and increased before mobility before the descent into the scrotum now intervaginal it is beyond the neonate age and this is the high investment of the tunica causes the testis to hang within the tunica like a clapper in the bell so if you look over here this is the normal attachment this is an abnormal attachment over here of the tunica vaginalis which predisposed to the torsion and this is your separation of the testes from the epidymis right so Various risk factors include your separation of epidermis and the inversion of testes. Now, factors determining the damage is your extent of twist. So, a 720 degree twist is definitely going to cause much more damage compared to a 360 degree twist. And the duration of damage, if it is done within six hours, you can actually salvage almost 100 percent of the testes. But if it is, and which drastically drops down to 20 hours if it is beyond the 24 hours period. 
right so clinical features include your sudden severe pain in groin and lower abdomen nausea scrotum is swollen and tender and cremastic reflex is lost now differential diagnosis includes the epidemiorchitis where the elevation of the testes usually reduces pain now this is known as your friend sign right and the idiopathic scrotal edema where usually you do not find any tenderness so another important entities are your torsion of appendix testes and torsion of appendix epididymis so this is your remnant appendix testes is your remnant of your mullerian duct and also known as high rated of morgagni and you have your blue down a blue dot sign seen and it is most common between the age 7 to 14 years and it can be treated conservatively now torsion of appendix epididymis is your remnant of wolfian duct now please remember this blue dot sign this can itself be asked as a direct one liner or it can be an image based question where you will be seeing a blue dot sign uh, where you will be seeing a blue dot in the testes which is seen in your torsion of appendix testes now this is an ultrasonography uh, right which is showing the one testes absent blood flow so in a colored doppler you would actually see in your testicular torsion absence of blood flow now when you do an exploration if it is viable you do a non-absorbable suture fixation and other testes are also fixed if you have a clinical doubt you wrap in warm swab incision in the tuninga albuginia and see if there is any bright red bleeding and if it is infected you need to remove and always make sure that the opposite side also you will do an orchidopexy now the examiner's favorite again for your FMG fornius gangrene. So this is your progressive infection of the genitalia perineum and perianal region. It is a mixed bacterial that is a polymicrobial infection associated with your diabetes, cancer, malnutrition and urological and colorectal inflammation. So hallmark is your rapid progression from symptoms and signs of cellulitis now there is intense pain and tenderness in your genitalia region the clinical features include your erythema swelling pain blister and foul smelling necrotic lesions and along with that you have your subcutaneous crepitation now the progress from the genitalia to perineum to abdomen occurs very rapidly now it is a surgical emergency where you would need to treat with surgical debridement iv antibiotics and urinary fecal dimension may be necessary it is not required in all the cases now testes is usually spared in your fornius gangrene because of the concept of the dual blood supply of the testes right now regarding your undescended testes now they usually complete the descent by your 30th week of gestation now how will you differ between the undescended and ectopic so if it is within the line of descent that is your undescended testes if it is deviating from your line of descent that is your ectopic so you can see the most common sites are your superficial ectopic femoral and your transverse uh, scrotal now 3% in your full term and 30% Premature in fans, one of both sides undescended, reach scrotum by first three months. Now, orchidopexy should be done within six to twelve months. Right side is much more common compared to left, and bilaterally seen in around twenty percent. Now, what are the consequences cases of undescended testes? It may be inf lead to infertility, malignancy. What is the most common malignancy? Seminoma, and a hernia ninety percent, and testicular torsion. Now, retractile testes, you have uh, it because of cremastric reflex now what happens in case of retractile testes your scrotum is well developed so that is how you are going to differentiate it from your undescended testes now this is your most important point uh, to be discussed in your undescended testes so if it is unilateral palpable non-palpable you do a laparoscopy if it has a blind ending vessels it is a monarchia and you excise the uh, part of it now if it is uh, doing a laparoscopy and you find that the vessels are exiting the internal ring then you go for an inguinal exploration followed by an orchipexy now if it is an intra-abdominal testis then you go for an orchiectomy that is when you find it to be a unilateral non-palpable now in case of bilateral non-palpable you first do an hcg there is no response that means it is an anarchia now if there is an increased testosterone uh, and increase FSH and, LH, uh, FSH and LH then you go for a laparoscopic or plus minus exploration now in case of intra-abdominal testes you again need to also do a fowler stephens orchiopexy which can be a laparoscopic approach or an open approach so normally 
what we can expect is that we just need to follow this chart unilateral non palpable bilateral non palpable unilateral non palpable next step laparoscopy bilateral non palpable next step hcg that is what we can get a question from here and then they might definitely step it up ahead now a few important short uh, disease uh, short note diseases from your urology before we wrap up the session today so hypospadia so this is one of the most common congenital malformation of the urethra now it is one in 300 male live births condition where urethral meatus opens on the underside of the penis or perineum ventral side proximal to the tip of glans penis now what are the characteristic features external meatus on the undersurface of penis ventral aspect of prepuce is poorly developed that is a huded prepuce now ventral deformity of the erect penis that is cordy most common type is your glandular type so if you look over here this is your glandular type this is your coronal type this is your penoscrotal type and this is your perineal type which is your most severe right now they may be associated with your undescended testes and inguinal hernia they have difficulty in urinary stream painful er erection and infertility now the important points that you need to remember is your principles of operation so you have orthoplasty which is the correction of cordy urethroplasty that is construction of new urethra mutoplasty that is mutual stenosis dilation and glandularplasty which is construction of glans penis now epispadias you have your dorsal so do not confuse it with hypospadias so epispadias is a dorsal penile defect which is usually a part of your extrophion epispa epispadias complex and the most severe variety is your ilocecal extrophy right now coming down to the posterior urethral valve so this is a congenital symmetrical valve in the posterior urethra below the veru montanum right so if you look over here this is a lateral view of a dilated posterior urethra so you can see this is uh, i'll just mark it with yellow right so this is your dilated posterior urethra now this is what your posterior urethral valve and you can see this as the trabeculated bladder right now what are the features the features include your obstructive flow of urine cricket wall bladder which are associated with vur now vur has been explained probably in your pediatric section so hence i'm not touching it up out here but it is a very 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 important uh, topic right and the treatment is by your fulguration of posterior urethral valves and your endoscopic destruction now apart from this so with this i have actually ended uh, i end my discussion which i had planned but i'll just give you one more extra point which i just remembered for your puj obstruction there is a procedure called which is called as anderson high pilo plasty right so this was all about your fmg master class of surgery for your july 2023 i hope you found it useful and will be finding it useful for your upcoming exam and i hope all the surgery questions can be solved from this class but definitely one class is not sufficient enough and that too are just a four to five hour class but do trust yourself keep revising because that is going to be the key to success right now if you have any doubts you can actually mail it down to me at this email id right i'll be happy to solve your doubts and apart from that you guys can actually follow me on my personal id on instagram and youtube so i have it shared it over here on youtube at ak surgery and insta is your dot surgery buddy right and also along with this there are many videos which i uh, uploaded only on the game pg app so at do follow at game pg app and uh, for your exams i would just say as the final message keep calm and the key to success is only going to be one which is revision revision and revision so don't panic keep revising for your exams don't think for the what is going to happen with next exams or uh, next pattern and all you have this july fmg happening so just focus stay calm stay relaxed and keep revising well and 
we at game are always there to help you so all the best take care